40. Droids often came from places like this. Therefore R2-D2 did not swivel his head as he looked out of the freighter. It was obvious that he was not surprised by what he saw. He opened the back hatch and rolled out. Once he was on the ground, he began swiveling his head, searching for something. R2 raised his video sensor and scanned the area. Then his head swiveled toward the astromech area, 80 meters to his left. He rolled down the concrete walk. Clearly this entire place had been designed for droids. At the edge of the walk, he encountered C-9PO. Brachis had sent 9PO to intercept R2 just before Brachis came out to greet Cole. I say, 9PO said. You're not one of ours, are you? R2 didn't answer. So really, you should go elsewhere to be recommissioned. I'm certain they could have done it on Coruscant. R2 sped up. The door to the astromech building was shut. R2's video sensor scanned for other entrances. The astromech building appeared to be underutilized. With the upgrading of X-Wings and other ships to do without astromech units, it made sense. But astromech units had other uses besides navigation. The upgraded units had to be manufactured somewhere. R2 veered to the left, following the walkway down. The C-9PO hurried after him. That facility is off-limits to old droids. 9PO said. You must stop immediately. R2 continued. The decline caused him to speed up even more. He was going slightly faster than usual. The protocol droid couldn't keep up. My master instructed me to have you wait, 9PO said with some alarm. The path forked and R2 took the right fork this time. It led to an open door. He zoomed inside, put down his brake, and stopped. 9PO was still yelling. The recommission area is above ground. It repeated the phrase several times, and then it said, as if speaking to itself, are two units. How dreadful. They never listened to their betters. R2 leaned against the wall. He used a tiny glow light beam to scan for a computer. The computer on the wall was merely a door panel. Whoever had designed this moon had done so with droids in mind. He couldn't jack in. The protocol droid's prissy voice floated down to him. I saw it disappear down this path. I believe we must conduct a search for it. It's not acting rationally. R2 used a glow light to scan the room. Mostly junk, scrapped equipment, and piles of corroded wire. Another door stood open at the end. He rolled toward the door. 9PO's voice grew fainter. R2 plunged deeper into Telti's droid factory, heading into the unknown, alone and unassisted. It hadn't taken Leia too long to reach Almania. She had circled the planet for some time before she got another sense of Luke. Then she found a docking bay near the area where she had felt his presence. The bay was perfect for the Alderaan the right size, the right construction, even the right weight restrictions. She slid her ship into the bay with no trouble at all. She sat very quietly in the darkness, waiting for something to go wrong. She was so nervous that she didn't trust what she was feeling. She was feeling that the entire planet was wrong somehow, that something was completely off kilter. She had felt that ever since she had slipped into the atmosphere, beneath their sensors, undetected and unwatched. That had bothered her. They were sending ships after her fleet, and they weren't watching their own skies. It felt like a trick Vader might pull, a double switch of some kind. As she brought the Alderaan in, she had watched for needle ships or other kinds of ships that could hide behind clouds and suddenly attack. Nothing. Just as there was no one in this bay. The planet felt deserted. That was what had bothered her. Even the bay, now that she looked at it closely, appeared unattended, as if no one had been in it for a long, long time. Tiles were falling out of the wall, and the Alderaan had kicked up dust as she slid into place. No one monitored the doors, or the nearby skies. If she had flown into a building, no one would have warned her. For a planet that had just declared war on the New Republic, that seemed decidedly odd. Unless Queller was using the tricks that the rebels had used during the fight against the Empire. Do the unexpected. 
always catch them off guard. It would mean that he had an inferior fighting force. Small forces always use commando tactics. It gave them the advantage. She suddenly wished she could contact Wedge. His attack would be different if he knew that Queller had few resources. She would order an all-out fight. But if Wedge thought Queller had a lot of ships, he might try strategy, he might start working according to all the battle orders that the military on Coruscant had developed over the years. She could sense no one around. She took her lightsaber, and her blaster, and set the Alderaan's internal alarms. She also set the self-destruct, should anyone other than the handful of authorized people overpower the alarms. Luke and Wedge were the only people nearby who could use the ship. Then she got out. The air smelled stale. Every movement she made kicked up dust. The equipment was rusted, the computer panels were ripped open. This bay was not abandoned, it had been murdered. Someone intended it never to be used again. Leia went to the bay doors. They were jammed open. Tiny footprints in the dust showed that some creatures had gotten used out of the area, but probably not the creatures the area had been designed for. She stepped outside into the fading light and saw dozens of buildings, all in a state of disrepair. It looked as if no one had lived on Almania in a long, long time. Yet she could feel Luke. He seemed much closer. And she could feel other presences as well. They seemed far away, and she couldn't tell how many of them there were. She would have to follow the feeling to find him. Someone was watching her. She whirled, the feeling as startling as if she had seen someone run across the street. But she was alone. She could see no one, feel no one, hear no one. Nothing had changed except the sudden crawling of her skin, the way the hair on the back of her neck rose. She dropped her hand so that it was close to her blaster, an old, practiced, nervous move. The shadows in the bay were deep, but they didn't move. She heard no breathing, saw nothing glinting in the darkness. She was alone. Someone was watching her. Surveillance? But all the obvious signs of it were ruined. The broken walkways around the doors, the shattered glass. Something terrible had happened to this place and she didn't know what it was. But she knew it precluded the standard forms of surveillance. She took a deep breath, unwilling to leave the Alderaan, but knowing that she had to. Maybe the sense she had gotten had come from Luke. Maybe it had come from Queller. It had probably come from Queller. He wanted her here. He had shown her Luke, had sent her messages right from the start. And her arrival had been too easy. Perhaps that made her the most nervous of all. Someone should have noticed her. Someone should have prevented her from flying onto Almania. Someone should have come after her by now. But she had no choice. She was on this course. Together she and Luke would be stronger than Queller. She had to remember that. The key, of course, would be to find Luke. Before Queller killed him. 41. Wedge stood in the command post of the Yavin, his legs spread, his hands clasped behind his back. His station was on a slight rise, with a bar below him. The Mon Calamari star cruisers these days were fancier than the ones he had first served in. These new ones were built from scratch, unlike the earlier models, which had been redesigned over pleasure yachts. The new ships had round command centers that took advantage of all parts of space. The command center was a clear bubble in the center of the ship, with catwalks crossing it. The catwalks were made of thin diamond-shaped mesh, which gave him an imperfect vision of the area below as well as above. Despite the fact that his people had designed them, Admiral Akbar had argued against these newer model ships, saying that they allowed an attacker to find the command center more easily. Wedge, on the other hand, liked them. They gave him the same feeling he had had as a fighter pilot a feeling that only a thin wall of material separated him from the vastness of space. It also gave him great perspective, allowing him to remember that in space battles, as opposed to ground battles, the attacks could come from any position, above, below, behind, or sideways. So many commanders forgot that after years out of a fighter pilot's chair. And it had been too long since Wedge was responsible only to himself. 
sometimes he missed those days. General, a fleet of ships has just left the planet's surface, the lieutenant on the lower level said. Keep me apprised, Wedge said. I think, sir, that we should reactivate the droids, said Sela, his second in command. She was a thin, nervous woman who had been a crack shot and an invaluable assistant on Coruscant. She had yet to prove herself in a battle command. We can fight without them. Wedge said. Begging the general's pardon, but our support services are hampered without their presence. Wedge nodded. But President Organa Solo went to some trouble to let us know about the droids. I think we should respect her choice. President Organa Solo does not command the fleet, Sila said. Wedge debated whether or not he should call her on her breach of military etiquette. Finally, he decided on the soft approach. President Organa Solo has led more troops into battle than you have ever seen, Major. I have learned, over the years, to pay attention to her suggestions. Sila sighed, clearly understanding the rebuff. Yes, sir. However, Major, if you can find a way to duplicate the droid services without reactivating them or pulling essential personnel, I will be grateful. Sila smiled and nodded. Yes, sir. She turned and hurried along the catwalk, as if his order had been her intention all along. Sir, said Jinbatham, a hig, from below. He was a slender blue creature whose piloting skills were renowned. Those ships are moving toward us quickly. How quickly? Wedge asked. They're moving faster than anything we have, sir. They appear familiar, sir, said Ian, a Mon Calamari. I think they're Imperial. What? Wedge asked. How is that possible? Their design, sir. They're Victory-class Star Destroyers, modified Imperial style. There? Wedge asked, not liking the sound of this. He had gone up against Victory-class Destroyers before. They had their weaknesses, but those weaknesses were hard to breach. How many are we looking at here? Three by my count, sir, said Ian. Along with a full complement of TIE fighters. Although there's something odd about the fighters. Figure out what that is. Wedge said. Let Sela know that we need A-wings out there, and quickly. He took a deep breath. He had not expected this. A ragtag fleet of some sort, perhaps, cobbled together from various other ships. Or maybe even a home complement. But not star destroyers, nor so many. This Queller had trained military personnel operating some of the most powerful ships in the galaxy. How had he come by all of this? And so quickly? And why did it feel so wrong? Wedge didn't have time to reflect on the answers. He gave the instructions to follow command pattern 2B, and almost belayed that order. Something was wrong here. Very wrong. Get Sila back into the command center. And get me General Susa, he said. We're breaking communication silence then, sir. Asked Dean. Wedge nodded. He needed to know if Sus's instruments showed the same squadron heading toward them, if somehow Queller had manipulated their technology. Leia, and the message she had sent with his staff, had implied that somehow Queller had messed with the droids. Maybe he controlled the scanning equipment as well. Still, Wedge had to prepare for a full-scale battle. For the first time in years, he was nervous. He hated being caught by surprise. His entire military zoomed through space. Several thousand troops and ground personnel. He had never expected to use them. But Queller was prepared. Despite what he had said to Yan, he planned for all contingencies. He was just surprised that his weapon hadn't worked. For the first time, it had failed to work in the way it was designed. Someone else had died. The droids hadn't been delivered to the right place. Brachis would pay. Later. Queller had to concentrate on the battle now. Although Leia Organa Solo's nearness was distracting. He had felt her ship break through the atmosphere, but he hadn't checked on her since. She wouldn't be hard to find. Her Jedi powers radiated from her like a searchlight. He would concentrate on her after he had defeated her fleet. He almost wished he was with his people. 
almost. But he knew the risks that entailed, and he didn't need risk now. Not with his objectives so close. Whatever happened in space mattered less than his defeat of Skywalker and his sister. Once they were gone, the galaxy would be his. It would take only an instant, and every threat to him would disappear. If Brachis hadn't betrayed him again. Sir, said Gant, his advisor. Commander Burr wants to know if you will be commanding from below. Queller smiled. His people never knew what he would do. Tell Commander Burr that I have full faith in his ability. And that I will be watching. Yes, sir, said Gant. That would be warning enough. His people knew that Queller judged failure harshly. If he got even a whiff of loss from his favorite commander, that commander would die. Queller would never lead a fleet in a traditional sense. He'd often felt that leaders who bothered with the trivia of who shot whom lost the battle. But he would lead as best he could from below. All he cared about was that the battle went his way. He didn't care who survived, as long as no one from the New Republic landed on Almania. No one except Leia Organa Solo, that is. 42. Han was frantic for Leia. More bombs on Coruscant. She might be dead by now. The entire planet might be in flames. He hoped she had gotten the children away. He backed away from Blue, from another old friend who had never been a friend at all, leaving her with Davis's body. All around them, the cries and the screams continued. Lando was powering up the Lady Luck. Han's repairs at least allowed that. Chewbacca was beside him. Han didn't know how much Chewie had heard. We have to get out of here. Coruscant was the intended target, Han said. Chewbacca moaned. But we can't leave these people like this. Han's brain was moving faster than his mouth. He wanted to be gone, wanted to be outside the run so that he could contact Coruscant and find out if anyone had survived. Find out if Leia had survived. His hands were shaking. All he could see was his beautiful wife, her white dress torn and scorch marked, her hair falling around her ears, her nose bleeding, her body bent with the strain of carrying a senator three times her own weight. Leia during the last bombing. She might have collapsed if he hadn't taken her from there. He wasn't there to rescue her now. Chewbacca was talking to him. Han hadn't heard much more than the last yowl. Yeah, I know, buddy. They need us here. Find out how many ships still work, how much rescue power we have here. Then let's load up the Falcon. I want to be one of the first ships off the run. We can find out about Coruscant then. Chewie moaned. Han nodded. We'll check Kashyyyk too. I'm sure your family is fine. There aren't many droids, at least that I remember. Chewie agreed with Han's recollection, and then walked off into the smoke to check on the availability of the other ships. Han took a deep breath, grateful for his mask. The smoke, though thinner, still filled the air. The air filtration system on Skip-1 had never been good. He wondered how many would die from smoke inhalation alone. A few of the smugglers with medical experience were working their way through the rubble, separating the survivors into groups. Han knew what they were doing, even though he deplored it. They were separating those who were likely to survive the next few hours from those who weren't. With limited medical resources, those who were likely to survive would have to receive treatment first. The cuts and bruises would wait, of course, but the risky procedures would wait as well. Better to save several lives than lose them, and the person being operated on, by wasting time. Time. This could be happening all over. It might be occurring on Coruscant even now. Leia. He climbed back over the rubble, resisting the urge to pull his blaster and shoot Blue out of existence. Doing that would only fuel his anger. That kind of revenge would only make matters worse. But it would make him feel a little less helpless. Because he knew, despite the efforts of the medical teams, and the other survivors, that this scene of devastation would be repeated all over the run. Skip 1 had droids, but so did Skips 2, 3, 5, and 72. He would wager even Nandri's and Skip, Skip 6, had several droids. 
Only there the loss of life might have been minimal, given the fact that Nandreason was gone. Han climbed the ramp to the Falcon. Inside he detached seats and made room on the floor, filling tiny storage areas with non-essential items. He would be able to carry a large group of wounded. He hurried down the ramp. The smoke was even thinner now. Across the devastation, he saw Lando loading stretchers of wounded onto the Lady Luck. Chewie was talking to the Celestans who had sprayed the last of the fires. They were nodding as they spoke. Han stopped near one of the few medical workers. I can take a shipload of the critically wounded, he said. Let's load them up. The medic's face was covered with soot and blood. He kept wiping his hands on the antiseptic wipes in his medical kit, but even then Han could see that the wipes were doing little good. The medic had several pairs of gloves in the kit, too, and he pulled them out each time he worked on a patient. I don't even know where to start, the medic said. Han's stomach was churning. For each life this man saved, he would lose another. The choices were impossible. They were not choices anyone should ever be required to make. Ever. Chewbacca had returned. He growled over the crying around him. Fifteen ships is better than I expected, Han said. Why don't you get them started loading the Falcon? I want to be in the first wave out of here. Chewie yarled his agreement. He hurried over to the medic, and together they examined which group of survivors should be moved. Han made his way across the rubble. As the smoke cleared, he saw more and more body parts among the stone and still hot metal. Fingers, wings, even one severed head. The stench of burning flesh made his already disturbed stomach churn even more. This time, though, as he passed wounded, he clasped the hands reaching for him. We'll get you out of here, he kept repeating over and over, hoping that the promise would keep the injured alive until someone did pull them free. Sometimes hope was all it took. Finally he reached the Lady Luck. Lando was carrying a Rurian. Its woolly coat was scorched, and most of the feathery antennae had burned away from its face. Its tiny mouth kept opening and closing, the only sign that it was alive. It'll take us days, Han, just to find everyone. Lando bent as he climbed up the ramp. The Lady Luck was a ghost of herself. Silas was making final repairs on the computer systems. Han scowled at him. Can you trust him? I honestly don't care, Lando said. He'll help me get these wounded off this rock. That's all that matters. Han nodded. The injured were already strewn around the luck. She no longer looked like a pleasure craft, but instead like a hospital ship from the rebellion. The moaning was terrible. Stis without hair, Budox without spikes, humans without arms made the devastation seem even more personal in here. I'm going to take a load out of the run. Blue told me that the droids that exploded were meant for Coruscant. Blue. Lando set the Rurian down on a pallet near a Rodian who was missing both eyes. But I thought, she was working for someone named Queller. From Almania. He wants Leia. Almania. Lando stood and put his hand on the small of his back as if it hurt him. It all comes back to that, doesn't it? Han nodded. I guess I was bait. If the droids were meant for Coruscant. Lando's voice trailed off. Then he smiled wanly. Tell you what, buddy. I'll do double runs here. You do what you have to. Han squeezed Lando's shoulder. You're a good friend, Lando. I've realized that more and more on this trip to the run. I reformed, Han, Lando said softly. There was a time when I wasn't much better than Blue. Han shook his head. You'd never have been a part of this, Lando. Ever. She knew what those droids would do. Lando grimaced. Card said things had changed here. No wonder he never wanted to come back. Yeah. Han started down the ramp then stopped. Thanks, he said. Lando made a vain attempt at a smile. You have it all, pal. I envy that. Someday, Lando, Han said. Someday, Lando agreed, and turned back to the Rurian to make it more comfortable. 
Han hurried out of the luck. He hoped he still had it all. Losing Leia and the children was a threat he seemed to have to deal with constantly, and it was one he never wanted to contemplate. He knew what he would do if they were murdered, and it would be ugly. If something happened to Leia and the children, Han would never be considered a nice again. The creature licked him. Luke put his arms over his head as the smooth tongue washed over him, once, twice, three times. The stench was incredible, but the sensation was actually pleasant. The burning pain in his back was easing. And he felt as if he had been wrapped in a thick, warm blanket. He had read about such things before, creatures with anesthetic in their saliva so that the intended victim would feel no pain as it died. Although he thought the anesthetic would also sap his will to live. It did not. He felt as if he was gaining strength. But he couldn't move. The tongue was heavy and effectively held him down. Then a picture grew in his mind. A little Luke cringing on the floor, holding a weapon. The pain in his hand, no, paw, and the blood. The confusion, why do these creatures constantly hurt him, and the deep, deep loneliness. A longing for cool woods and fresh water, and sunlight. Sunlight. It, the Thurnby, missed sunlight. It was psychic. The creature had psychic powers. The Thurnby had tapped into Luke's mind. Hey, Luke said. His voice was muffled against the large tongue. I need to breathe. Immediately the tongue pulled away from him. He felt a twinge of fear in the large creature, a hope that he wouldn't attack it again. Luke took a deep breath and held out his hand. I'm not holding anything. The creature tilted its head. It didn't understand him. Luke formed a picture in his own mind, that of himself, breaking the splinters over his knee and tossing them away. Then he imagined pulling the splinter from the Thurnby's paw and medicating the wound. I'm sorry, Luke said. I thought you were going to hurt me. The Thurnby sent images. Tiny people attacking it, biting it, slapping at it, screaming, poking it with sticks and flames. It would bat them away, and eventually, they would die. Its meals came so irregularly that sometimes it would have to eat the dead, a thought that made it vaguely ill. Even the meat it had eaten upset its stomach. Here it had to chew its food, which disgusted it even more. Thurnbees could eat meat, but they preferred vegetation and small slithery creatures that resembled snakes. Its teeth were made for ripping branches and leaves, and pulling the slithery creatures into its mouth. It preferred to eat something large, and then not eat again for weeks. But in this place, it had only had tiny bits of food. Its body was three times smaller than it should be. The Thurnby was starving to death. Slowly. All alone in the dark. Luke shuddered. He had no idea how long the creature had been here but he deduced it had been a while. He stood and walked over to it, then pointed at the grates in the ceiling. He imagined the Thurnby batting the grate out with its paws. The Thurnby stood on its hind legs and stretched its long body. The grate was about a meter higher than its paws could reach. It showed him all its attempts to escape, trying to get the guards, trying to use pieces of wood, trying to jump. Nothing loosened the grate. I could, Luke thought. The Thurnby looked quizzical again. Its eyes were round and blue and very gentle, its nose a delicate pink. Its teeth had the blunted edges of vegetarian animals. Luke wondered how he had ever thought it dangerous. He imagined himself on the tip of the Thurnby's paws, climbing through the bars in the grate and releasing the Thurnby. The creature sat on its haunches, glanced at the grate, then at Luke, and sent him a picture of himself, pulling through the bars in the grate and walking away. It had happened before. The creature showed a few other humans doing the same thing. The images came mixed with a lot of sadness, and an unwillingness to trust again. Luke pondered the image for a moment. Then he let his memories slide into images, showing himself working with Yoda, helping the Jawa on the eye of Palpatine, talking to Anakin, Jason, and Jaina in the medical center. He showed examples of his work with the students from various species, and he showed what he could of Jedi philosophy. Most of it seemed simplistic, done in imagery alone, but it apparently got the message across. 
The Thren Bee extended its left paw, the uninjured paw. Without hesitating, Luke stepped on it and began climbing. It was hard because he couldn't put any weight on his left ankle. Mostly he had to pull with his arms. He climbed to the top of the pad and grabbed the claw. The claw was about the length of his leg, and he had to wrap both arms around it to hang on tightly. The thern bee stood on its hind legs, stretched its long body, and reached toward the grate. Luke stood, carefully leaning against the claw, and managed to grip the metal. Then he pulled himself up. The air was clearer here. The corridor was wide and clean. The walls were made of a material he had never seen before, some sort of gray paperish substance that had small designs embellishing it. He didn't have time to look. He peered back through the grate. The thern bee was on its haunches again, its eyes glowing in the darkness. Luke scented an image of the floor above. Then he scanned the edges of the grate to see if he could pull it free. Actually, said a voice behind him, you have to pull the lever. Over to your left. Luke looked. A lever extended from the floor tiles near the wall. Beside the lever stood four guards, all holding blasters on him. They were wearing stormtrooper uniforms. The guard who had spoken had his mask off. He nodded in the other direction. Luke turned. Seven more guards covered him from the other side. A feeling of despair so fierce it almost knocked him over filled him. The feeling was coming from the Thernby. Luke wanted to send it an image, warning it not to give up, but he didn't know how. Nor did he have the time to concentrate on it. Instead, he said, what makes you think I want the lever? The stormtrooper shrugged. It would make for a lot of chaos around here to free the Thernby. That it would. Luke wished he had thought of that immediately. He could have leaped for the lever and the situation would have changed, instantly. But he hadn't. He would have to fight this one alone. I guess I'm your prisoner again, he said. What do you plan to do with me? No one answered him. Luke smiled at them. Have you ever met a Jedi Master before? They stared at him. He used his good foot to leap across the grate and hit the lever with his bad ankle, forcing the lever back despite the pain. As he did so, he used all his strength to pull the blasters toward him. A huge wind blew up and yanked them toward him. It sapped him, made him weak. He wondered vaguely if the same thing had happened to Vader when he had made the same move in Cloud City. Then the grate fell open with a bang, nearly knocking over two of the guards. The blasters skidded near Luke's feet. The guards were clinging to the walls, the floor, even the edges of the grate to avoid being swept away by the wind that Luke had created. He bent over to pick up the blasters as something large and fuzzy and white floated past his vision. The Thernby had jumped out of its cell. Luke let the wind die. The moment the guards landed on their feet, they were screaming and running away. Luke grinned at the Thernby. The creature's eyes twinkled. We got them that time. Luke said. He gathered up all eleven blasters, and found various ways to hook them to his clothing. But I have a hunch that, from now on, things aren't going to be that easy. 43. The TIE fighters arrived first, zooming by with their characteristic whine. Or at least that was how Wedge imagined them. He was standing in his command center watching the TIE fighters on three different sets of tactical computers. In the space around him, he could see small blips that probably were the Star Destroyers, but he couldn't see the fighters. He wouldn't be able to unless they were right over him. Man, he missed fighting. Blue Squadron has reached the TIE Fighters, sir, said Jinbatham. Let's monitor this, Wedge said. Instantly the crackle of the poor communication systems in the A-Wings filled the command center. Overhead Blue Leader. Copy Blue 5. Sending more fighters. I can't believe all these ships. Keep to the pattern, Blue 10. Wedge stared at the screen, fists clenched. He wanted to be holding the joystick, issuing the orders to attack the TIE fighters. Instead, he was coordinating. He hated it. Green 8, watch your back. I see him. Move 3.1, Green 8. I'll get him. Copy. 
I've got him. I, static. The blip on the screen that marked Green 6 was gone. There were suddenly dozens of TIE fighters all around. They're going to get slaughtered out there, Sila said. We need reinforcements. Not yet, Wedge said. We don't know how many ships they have. They can't have a lot. We never heard about the Empire storing that many ships. Her comment bothered him. All around, the voices continued. Lost tactical, yellow leader. I am returning to base. Copy, yellow 2. Green leader, 8 more TIE fighters bearing 5.3. I've got them. Two TIE blips disappeared off his map, followed by three of his own ships. Wedge frowned. Beneath you, blue 8. I'll get him. It's too late, the voice disappeared in a scream that ended in more static. Bearing down 1.8. I count six more launching. Copy, blue leader. I got him. I got him. I, more blips disappearing. Wedge looked at the pattern. Typical Imperial fight squadron. Ties deployed in an ancient pattern. One he hadn't seen since the battle for the Death Star. I destroyed the people of Padir without using anything as crude as a Death Star or a Star Destroyer. Six more blips exploded on the screen as his squads hit TIE fighters. I'm going for the launching area. Watch my back. And Wedge had seen the notice for Imperial junk. All sorts of weaponry being sold, no matter the condition, for a lot of money. Entire green squad. Take as many TIE fighters as you can. We need to concentrate on those destroyers. I prefer elegant, simple weapons, don't you? And what would Wedge do if he had a simple, elegant weapon waiting in the wings? An all-out assault to distract the incoming force. Change plans, he said, whirling away from the console. I want the entire fleet to go in. Sir. Sila said. She clearly thought he had gone mad. That's all the hardware he's got. He's counting on his big, nasty weapon to take care of us. These are decoys. Let General Susa know that his squad needs to avoid the fighting. Have him round Almania, approach from the side or from above. Queller doesn't have the power to fight a flanking maneuver. I want the rest of the ships to engage in an all-out assault on his forces. If this is just a hint of his firepower, sir, this will be suicide. Wedge shrugged. The mission already had a hint of suicide. Political suicide. He might as well make it the real thing. The droids headed toward Cole. 3PO watched. The droids were assassin droids, upgraded with laser cannons in the chest. Nothing would remain of Cole after those droids finished with him. But 3PO could do nothing. He was too far away. And in trouble himself. The tunnel he was in claimed to lead to a circuit department. Any unmarked droids found in this area, one sign warned, would be disassembled. Look, a protocol droid. The nasal voice belonged to a gladiator droid. An old protocol droid. You shouldn't disparage me, 3PO said as he looked toward the voice. Then he stopped speaking. This droid was new. It was a bright, shiny red, as if it were made from a thousand red coins. Its eyes flared black in its narrow face. And why not, you out-of-date hunk of tin? I, ah, uh, 3PO turned his head. I, I am fluent in more than six million forms of communication. And I bet none of them would convince me to leave you in one piece. The gladiator droid sounded almost gleeful. Ah, excuse me. 3PO said. You are a gladiator droid, aren't you? Does it matter? I can still tear your limbs off in record time. I do not doubt it, 3PO said. Although I would wonder why you would want to. I'm just a protocol droid. I really am of no interest to you. You're of plenty of interest, the gladiator droid said. You came in here unauthorized. I get to destroy unauthorized droids. Oh, dear, 3PO said. Why would you want to do that? 
why would you want to learn 6 million forms of communication? Well, if you're a gladiator droid, 3PO said, swiveling his head as he searched for an exit, then you must gladiate. Right? Sorry, oh ancient one. I may have started life as a gladiator droid, but I'm not one anymore. I belong to the elite guard here on Telti. They call us the Red Terror. They? 3PO's voice squeaked. The other droids. The finished ones. They know if they misbehave, they'll meet the Red Terror. We'll tear them from limb to limb, and then we'll wipe their memories. And we'll scatter the parts all over the moon so that they can't be reassembled. There was a door at the end of the corridor, but it was closed. Above it, in several droid languages, was the word exit. Two more red droids joined the first one. How many of you comprise the Red Terror? 3PO asked. There's 500 of us scattered over the moon, the first droid said. But it's your lucky day. Only 50 of us are near this building. I send out a call. All for me? 3PO's hands fluttered. Surely one protocol droid wouldn't require so much attention. Maybe not. If you're working alone. But if you've got some friends around, then we might need the whole force. You don't have friends here, do you? Certainly not. 3PO said. I have no friends. Here. I am here for myself. On my own. To revisit my place of origin as it were. Didn't you know that protocol droids must do this every hundred years? Three more red droids joined the first one. I've never heard of it, the first droid said. Me, neither, said one of the newcomers. Well, it only happens with droids whose memories have never been wiped. I'm overdue, actually. I've been in the same state of mind probably too long. In fact, if you could just show me where the oil baths are located, I'll be on my way. 3PO started to walk toward the exit. Two more red droids blocked it. Not so fast, old one, the first droid said. No other protocol droid has shown up here like this. How many droids do you know who've never gone through a memory wipe? 3PO asked. I almost had one on Cloud City many years ago, but a friend of mine found me in the trash and pulled me free. If that had happened, I wouldn't be here now. But I am here and... Do all protocol droids talk this much? One of the red droids asked another. Oh, no, 3PO answered. It's a flaw in my model. I was rather hoping to find a solution without having to go through a wipe. You can't imagine what it's like, having all of your memories intact. It's rather wonderful, if you want me to be honest, but it's also a burden. Why, I can remember the first time I saw a gladiator droid. It must have been on Coruscant. That was before the rebellion, of course, let's wipe him, one of the new droids said. No, the first droid said. I'm curious. I'd like to know how a droid avoids memory wipes. I have been very lucky, 3PO said. I have a sympathetic master who believes that droids are unique creatures all by themselves. He's lying, one of the droids said. Maybe, another said. Maybe not. My master values me for what I am, and won't let anyone harm me. Your master's the guy with the freighter? The first droid asked. Oh, no, 3PO said. He's just someone I met. My master is, actually, I have several masters. I usually work for President Leia Organa Solo on Coruscant. But sometimes I work for the Jedi Master Luke Skywalker. Then why are you traveling with someone else? He wanted me to come along because of my facility with languages. I persuaded him to stop here. I have my pilgrimage, you know. 3PO had managed to take several steps closer to the door. The droids nearest the door had parted. They were all watching him closely. Droids hated memory wipes. The fact that he had never had one intrigued them all. Yeah, right, the first droid said. And he listened to you. Master Fardreamer is a unique man. Rather like Master Skywalker in that. Skywalker, said one of the new droids. 
Isn't that the one who was here before? The one we couldn't touch. Another droid shushed the first. Master Skywalker was here? 3PO asked. I thought you would know where your master is, the first droid said. Well, he's not always my master. I thought I explained that. You've explained a lot, the first droid said. Except what you're doing here. I explained that too, 3PO said. If you'll recall, I said that I have returned to my origins. The story would have worked, too, the first droid said, if this factory made protocol droids a hundred years ago. But we only just started with protocol droids after the Empire collapsed. When the New Republic was up and running, the Master figured there'd be a greater need for you brainy types. So he added on. 3PO took another step toward the door. The droids behind him closed the opening they had made. The first droid slid in closer, flanked by his red companions. So, he said. When a protocol droid gets a memory wipe, does he have to relearn all six million forms of communication? Of course not, that's hardwired in. Then 3PO realized what the droid meant. Wait. Wait. I'm sure you won't have to give me a memory wipe. You don't know who I am. You can't touch me. It will be an intergalactic incident. My mistress, won't matter anymore, the droid said. You've never had a memory wipe so let me explain how it feels when you wake up. You view the world with fresh new eyes. Everything will seem so wonderful. You'll have your six million languages, and a whole new future. Won't that be nice? No. 3PO said as the Red Terror closed in. I don't think that will be nice at all. 44. As Leia slipped into the tunnel, the feeling of being watched vanished. So did her confidence. She felt as if she were suddenly plunged into a mental darkness. The tunnel was beside a larger building, a stone tower that had fallen into disrepair. Many stones had fallen off the sides, making the tower seem gap-toothed. It almost looked as if it had been rattled by a giant hand. The tower wasn't too far from the docking bay, but she wouldn't have found it on her own. Someone had been planting pictures in her mind. Not maps, exactly, and not accurate pictures of the way things were now, but of how they had appeared sometime before. The tower had no holes in it, the streets were full of people and mechanized vehicles, and flowers bloomed everywhere. Now there were no flowers, people, or vehicles. Just an ominous silence, and lots of destruction. The images had soothed her. She had checked her feelings. She knew the communication wasn't coming from Queller. Every time he had sent something, she had seen his mask. She hoped they came from Luke. If not, she was prepared. She had her blaster and her lightsaber, and she was determined. She had only been this determined a few times in her life when she went after the Death Star, when she helped the Nogri, and when Hethra had stolen her children. She could feel Luke. His presence was somewhere near her, below her. The tunnel had been the correct direction. Only she didn't know why the images had disappeared. She slowly levered her way downward. The tunnel was made of stone too, and it smelled faintly musty. It hadn't been used in a long time. It was larger than she had expected from the images she had received. Somehow she had thought it would be a tight fit against her body. It wasn't. It was the size of a large room. Handholds and rusted metal functioned as a ladder on one wall. It almost felt as if she were crawling down a well. But she wasn't, if the images were to be believed. This was an old escape route for the builders of the tower. She should arrive on a main floor. The climb down took forever. She was glad she kept herself in good shape. Her arms and legs were getting tired from the repetitive motion. Every movement she made echoed in the wide expanse, and the farther she got from the surface, the darker it got. She reached with her mind, hoping to receive more images. But the blackness continued there too. She felt Luke just below her, and then she got bombarded with imagery, white, white, White creatures running in sunlight, the reflection off their fur dazzling. Roses. 
The scent of roses everywhere, and green leaves, and slittery food, real food. And water and sky. And a sense of joy so powerful it nearly made her lose her grip on the rungs. The sendings hadn't been coming from Luke. They had come from someone else. Luke's presence was a constant note below the joy. She hoped he was all right. She hoped she had made the right choice in coming here. She reached the end of the tunnel, and found herself standing on a ledge above a wooden trapdoor. The door had a rusted metal handle. She pulled, and the door groaned. Then it snapped open. Below she saw a giant white face, with a pink nose, a huge pink mouth, and blue eyes the size of puddles. Its mouth opened, and she pressed herself against the stone, reaching for her blaster as she did so. It's all right. The voice belonged to Luke. He's a friend of mine. I think he's just happy to see you. Then she frowned at it. The creature was white all over, like the creatures she had seen in the sunlight. The joy had come from it. Would you tell him to move so I can join you too? It'll take a moment. The creature turned its head, and daintily, if something that size could be called dainty, stepped aside. Leia gripped the ledge and levered herself out. She found herself hanging in a corridor filled with blasters, a huge open grate, and the signs of a recent scuffle. Luke was sitting on the iron bars of the grate. His companion filled the hallway a few meters away. Leia dropped, careful to land beside the grate, and not in the open hole that seemed to extend forever. What is this place? She asked. From what I can gather, Luke said, it's some sort of dungeon. The Thurnby has been here a long time. Leia looked at the creature. Its gigantic tail swept back and forth, making a pounding sound each time it hit the wall. You sent me the map, she said. He doesn't speak, Luke said. I'm not even sure if he understands spoken language. He's psychic. And friendly, I trust, Leia said as she made her way to Luke. Very friendly. Too friendly, sometimes. Luke watched her walk, which seemed to her a sign that he wasn't well. That and the odd greenish color of his skin. His clothing was torn and blackened, the edges of his hair were singed, and his artificial hand had lost all its skin. He had a splint around his left ankle. As she picked her way across the rungs of the grate, she saw that the back of his shirt was gone. Most of his skin was missing there, too. It was a running, pus-covered mass of sores. What happened to you? She asked. My X-wing exploded, he said. He held a blaster in one hand, and several more were tied to him. The Thurnby was watching them, his tail twitching. Leia felt her heart skip a beat. Imperial detonators, she said. He shook his head. That doesn't feel right. No, Luke, I saw them. They're in the computer systems. He sighed. She hovered over him, uncertain what to do. She had never seen him like this, wounded, exhausted, and hesitant. The Alderaan is nearby. I know, Luke said. I'm sure Queller knows too. I wish, he stopped himself. You wish I hadn't come. But I'm here now. We have to get you out of here. He wants to kill us, Luke said. If he kills us, he thinks he'll be the next emperor. Leia smiled. I'm no longer on the council. No matter what he does to us, he won't be able to influence them. It has nothing to do with the council, Luke said. It has to do with our Jedi abilities. He thinks that he has to defeat us. Then why hasn't he tried to kill you? He needed me to bring you here. She glanced at the Thurnby. He was watching them. Are you sure you can trust that creature? Luke raised his head. I forgot, he said. He closed his eyes. His forehead scrunched with concentration. Leia didn't like the lull. She picked up blasters and attached them to her clothing as best she could. Then Luke opened his eyes. The Thurnby was standing. His tail had stopped wagging and was moving slowly, as if in confusion. It looked like a giant puppy, eager and uncertain as to what to do next. Go home. 
Luke said and waved his hand at it. Please. The Thurnby took two steps and was suddenly beside him. Luke raised his hands over his head as the Thurnby licked him. Leia cried out, and the Thurnby backed off. It's okay, Luke said to her. He smiled at the Thurnby and patted his nose. Go home, he whispered. The creature jumped the open hole and ran down the hallway, leaving hundreds of large white hairs behind it. Come on, Luke said. Let's go to the Alderaan. His clothing was dripping. Shouldn't we clean you off first? Luke shook his head. The Thurnby saliva has some numbing properties. I know it hasn't healed me, but it improves my strength. There's a long ladder up there, Leia said. Think you can climb? Anything to get out of here, Luke said. I don't understand, Leia said. If Queller wants us both so badly, why has this been easy so far? For you, maybe, Luke said. But I wouldn't have gotten all these blasters without the Thurnby's help. Queller had a dozen guards stationed at this grate. I think this is a lull while they go back for reinforcements. Let's make the best of this while we can. He stood slowly, and despite what he had said about the Thurnby's numbing saliva, Leia saw pain on his face. He gathered the last of the blasters, and tied them to his torn clothing. He limped to the space below the tunnel, looked up, and took a deep breath. Leia frowned. He would never be able to jump that distance. Then he closed his eyes, lifted his injured leg, and jumped. He landed gracefully on the ledge, and gripped the rung quickly, using the strength in his arms to brace himself. Extending his injured leg, he hopped up a few rungs. She frowned. She had never mastered that trick. The hole below was even deeper. Luke, she said. You've done it before, Leia. I can't do it now, she said. He climbed down the rungs and held out his hand. I'll catch you. Your back won't tolerate that. She said. It will handle that better than lifting you up here. He peered at her, and was suddenly her strong, invincible brother again. Come on. All you need is a bit of faith in yourself. She had little faith in herself, when it came to her Jedi talents. They were intermittent, and she hadn't been able to train them properly. Leia. His voice sounded calm, but she could hear the urgency in the way he clipped her name. The old Luke, the boy she had met, would have shouted at her. The Jedi Master knew the value of calm, but the impatience still existed underneath. She closed her eyes. Instead of imagining the ledge, she thought about the hole beneath, and then realized that would send her into the deep darkness. She took a breath, cleared her mind, and pictured the surface with its broken rocks and high tower. From the corridor, she heard a scraping. Voices. Someone was coming. Leia. She crouched and then jumped, opening her eyes as she went. She was spinning as she shot past Luke. She missed the top of the tunnel by a meter, then started to fall. Grab on. Luke was shouting. Other voices echoed below. Grab on. She was still spinning, and that allowed her to move toward the walls. She reached for a rung, missed, and slapped her hand along several more rungs before being able to grab on. The jolt on her arm sent pain shuddering through her. She stopped moving with such force that she felt it along her spine, back, and neck. Luke was climbing toward her like a Wookiee, moving quickly despite the pain he must have been feeling. Stormtroopers in the corridor, he said. We have to get out before they think of going to the top. They'll see the trapdoor is open. Yeah, but they may not know where it leads, Luke said. I don't think this place was built by Queller. I think you're right. Leia put the other hand on the next rung and climbed as quickly as she could. She felt shaken, but oddly exhilarated. She had done it. She had used the force to help augment her own physical strength, just as Luke always told her she could do. The voices were getting louder, but Leia was nearing the top. She could see light ahead. Hey, Leia. Luke's whisper sounded loud in the wide tunnel. Good job. Praise, from Luke, meant a lot. Thanks, she said. She glanced over her shoulder. 
Luke was pale, but he was making it. His back looked raw and painful. When he saw her, he grinned. Then he put a finger to his lips. Leia nodded and kept climbing. The light was fading near the top, the day had to be ending, but she kept moving. She knew she could find the Alderaan in the dark, but she didn't want to. The feeling of joy was leaving her. The Thurnby had to be far away by now. In its place was a very real concern for Luke, and an even bigger concern that Queller hadn't shown up yet. If he thought Luke and Leia were such a threat, he would love to have them both together. But he didn't. She crested the top, pulled herself out, and surveyed her surroundings. The area was in twilight, and the air had a bit of a chill. Nothing had changed near the tower. The streets, the buildings, everything was empty. She turned and leaned over the opening to the tunnel to help Luke up. The emptiness bothered her. She remembered Queller's words, I prefer simple, elegant weapons. Weapons that were hard to see? She grabbed Luke's right hand and pulled him out of the tunnel. She supposed she would find out. R2 had followed a maze of corridors, and passed a dozen protected computer panels. The numbers of panels had quadrupled. He was nearing the command center. This corridor was cleaner than the others. There were no other droids. A single scrambled announcement overhead warned about some kind of terror. R2 moaned softly. The computer panels were lower in this corridor, and the protect circuits less sophisticated. The floor no longer had ruts for Treadwell droids, but was smooth, designed for human or imitation human feet. He was close. He sped up. As he did, the walls all around him suddenly showed holos. Moving holos of a scene below. R2 kept going, but the information was instantly stored in his systems. He saw a freighter, and beside it, Master Fardreamer talking with Brachis, a former student of Master Luke's. R2's highly sensitive electronic sensors picked up a were behind him. Then he heard another, and another. They were nearly eight meters off, but closing quickly. He rolled into a closet off the corridor. As the closet door closed, though, the interior dropped like an express fighter for several floors. R2's delicate balance systems were thrown off and he tipped on two wheels, catching the top of his head against the wall. He was trapped. Then the closet hit the bottom of its shaft so hard that he tilted in the exact opposite direction. He brought down his third wheel and managed to balance himself even though his head was spinning. Literally. His sensors registered dark wall, dark wall, dark wall, door. Dark wall, dark wall, dark wall, door. Dark wall, dark wall, dark wall, door. Gradually he got control of his head, and found it facing the door when the door slid open. And revealed a room filled with our twos, our fives, and all the other astromech series, from our ones to our sevens. They were leaning on each other. Some heads swiveled as our two appeared. Others' electronic eyes flashed. A few moaned, and in the back, one cylinder popped. The floor catapulted R2 out the door, and he screamed as he flew toward the back of the room. He flew over hundreds, no, thousands, of astromech droids before he crashed on a pile of R5s. He beeped an apology, but they didn't respond. They were still activated, but listless. He swiveled his head, and whistled in impressed surprise. The room extended for at least a kilometer and every centimeter was filled with astromech droids. The junk heap for unwanted droids that 3PO had always warned him about really did exist. And now he was stuck in the middle of it. Maybe forever. 45. Han's palms were wet. He had never been so uncomfortable flying the Falcon before. He had to pilot carefully. Most of his injured and dying passengers were not strapped in. Any unusual maneuver he made could hurt them further. Chewie seemed just as uncomfortable and the cockpit smelled of nervous Wookiee. The cockpit door was open, and through it, Han could hear the moans of the injured. One run medical droid accompanied them, despite the protests, and one run medical officer. Two experts for nearly a hundred passengers. The Falcon was only built to carry eight people comfortably, 
but Han had quickly converted the cargo areas, the escape pods, and the secret compartments to accommodate the injured. Loading had taken forever, and when he looked out the door of the Falcon it seemed as if he hadn't made a dent. It would take days, maybe weeks, just to get through the rubble on skip one. That didn't count what would happen on the other skips. Chewbacca growled at him. I see it. Han said, and dodged a group of rocks the size of landspeeders. Since he had left the run, he'd been navigating through the garbage surrounding the asteroid belt. Normally, he flew the Falcon sideways and upside down to get through this area. But this time he had to fly like a glottalfib ship half filled with water. Every time someone screamed in the back, Han jumped as if he had been blaster shot. They were nearly out. And once they were out, Han had to do two things. He had to find a planet that would take all these wounded, and he had to find out about Leia. Chewbacca reached over his head and adjusted the navigation controls on the ceiling. The Falcon tipped dangerously sideways, and scrapes echoed through the back compartments, followed by shouts of pain. Sorry, sorry, Han mumbled under his breath. He was beginning to understand why he'd gone into smuggling. It was a lot easier than emergency medical lifts. Finally the Falcon broke free of the belt. Send a distress signal, Chewie, Han said. He opened his own channels, to see what messages he had. Someone would have sent him word of Leia. He had just gotten to the messages when Chewie yarled. He had hailed Re, one of the planets closest to the belt. They had responded to the emergency. Han identified the Falcon, and then said, I am Han Solo, husband to President Leia Organa Solo of the New Republic. I have a shipload of injured here. Some of them are dying. Do you have the facilities to deal with this? Our systems have tracked your progress, President Solo. Your ship came from Smuggler's Run. Han didn't try to correct their misconception about his own political position. Yes, he said. I was on an investigative mission there when the run was attacked. Are the attackers in pursuit? The Reens were notoriously suspicious of violence. It was a long-distance attack, Han said. Their droids exploded. Droids? All of their droids? No, Han said, deciding to come clean. Only the most recently stolen ones. Some suspect the droids were bound for Coruscant. Can you vouch for the honesty of your passengers? The Reen asked. Chewbacca glanced at Han. Han bit back an angry reply. It wouldn't work. Yes, he said. And at the moment, he could. None of the smugglers on his ship was in any condition to steal anything. Upon the strength of your word, then, President Solo, we accept your injured. We will prepare our facilities. The coordinates follow. Chewbacca entered the coordinates into the navigational computer, and carefully turned the Falcon toward Re. Han got out of his chair and went to the door, bracing himself with both hands on the frame. The devastation before him was as bad as it had been in the run. Maybe worse, because here he could see the extent of the damage on individual lives. Burned bodies, lost limbs, featureless faces. The images of lost hope, and lives changed forever. I just got word from Re. They'll be taking us. His words sounded hollow over the cries of the injured. He didn't know how many people heard him, and of those who did, how many actually understood what he said. He turned away, even more discouraged than before. He climbed back in the chair, shook his head at Chewie, and checked the messages stored for him. There were several from Leia, none recent. The most recent message he had came from Anoth, sent just before Han emerged from the run. He had it play in hollow form. It was from Anakin. The room behind him was dark, and he was hunched near the console. Obviously everyone else was asleep, and he was sending a message without permission. Papa? He whispered. Something bad happened, and I can't get Mama or Uncle Luke. Han felt a pang that his son had turned to Luke before coming to Han. But the children always did on force matters. They knew Han had no expertise in that area. Winter says we would hear if something went wrong. But Papa, I keep having dreams of a dead man. Bad things are going to keep happening again, I know it. 
He glanced over his little shoulder, as if he had heard a noise. Then he hunched even closer to the console. Please call when you get this. Please. Anakin's image winked off. Chewbacca growled softly. Han glanced at his old friend. Chewie's eyes were narrowed with concern. You're right, Han said. What kind of father am I? It hadn't even occurred to me that they might have taken Coruscant droids to Anoth. Chewie growled again. Han nodded. Chewie was right. The message had come after the destruction had occurred on the run. The children, whom he never thought were in danger until Chewbacca had mentioned it, were safe. Nothing had happened. Except Anakin had felt something bad. The destruction on the run? Or something even worse? The children had been very upset by the explosion in the Senate Hall. Luke had told him of the extent of their distress. He had been too distressed himself to see it. Chewie howled at him. Yeah, I will check up on him, Han said. But first I want to know what's happening on Coruscant. I can't very well comfort the kid if... Han stopped himself from saying anything about Leia. He couldn't make assumptions about Coruscant. Just because the droids were meant for the center of government didn't mean they had exploded there too. But the chances were that they had. He swiveled back toward the console and hailed Leia on Coruscant. Almost immediately, Mon Mothma's face appeared on his small screen. Han, she said. We'd almost given up on you. His hands were shaking. Chewie moaned softly. I was looking for Leia, Mon Mothma. Mon Mothma nodded. Apparently you haven't gotten her messages, then. She's not here. She's not? Han's mouth was dry. Is she all right? As far as I know, Mon Mothma said. We've just discovered that she and Wedge took a fleet to Almania. Almania? That was where those mysterious messages had come from. Where the man that Blue had talked about lived. Queller seemed to be everywhere. Why? The ruler there threatened the New Republic, and Leia in particular. He has Luke there as a prisoner. Luke? Blue's voice echoed in Han's ear. He wants her and Skywalker gone. She went after him. Until she got wedged to go with her, what she did was her business, Han, Mon Mothma said in her calm way. She resigned. She resigned? Each announcement hit him harder. How long had he been gone? Leia loved her post. She would never resign. Mon Mothma nodded. She believes that Queller, the Almanian ruler, is force-sensitive. She thinks he has no real interest in the Republic. Instead his interest is in her and her family. She may be right. Would you like me to download his message to her? Yes, Han said. Mon Mothma was about to sign off when Chewie moaned again. Oh, right, Han said. The degree of his upset showed when he couldn't remember his initial fears. Mon Mothma, is everything all right on Coruscant? The Imperials and the Council are in an uproar about Leia's departure. They want you for treason, Han, because there is some evidence linking you with the Senate Hall bombing, and the local garbage workers have just gone on strike because of some confusion in their last three credit payments. She grinned. Business as usual, I would say. He didn't even want to think about the treason claim. It probably had to do with those messages Lando had told him about. Anything with droids? She frowned. Now that you mention it, we got an odd message from Luke. He must have sent it before his capture or maybe just after since it was in code. It warned us to shut off all the new droids. I trusted the source and did. That started a whole new level of complaints. You should hear, you shut them down. Han closed his eyes and let relief flood him. If Luke hadn't warned them, all of Coruscant would be in the same kind of ruin that the run was in. Yes, Mon Mothma said. Is that significant? I was thinking of reactivating them. I simply can't deal with that crisis on top of all the others. Don't, Han said. Chewie was yowling at the same time, saying the same thing in Wookiee. We have a ship full of injured smugglers. 
the droids they had stolen from Coruscant exploded. In fact, Chewie will send you the signatures of several smuggling ships. They'll need help finding medical facilities. Mon Mothma's normally calm features had gone a deadly pale. They exploded? Is this what happened in the Senate Hall? I think so, Han said. She took a deep breath, obviously settling herself. Well, then, I guess we won't reactivate them until we find the source of the problem. Thank you, Han. I wish I could say it was my pleasure. But I've got hundreds of dead and injured colleagues that somehow robbed the moment of joy. Mon Mothma nodded. She understood, perhaps better than most. Han, she said. Leia perceives this threat from Almania as a personal one. I gathered that. Thanks, Mon Mothma. I'm sending the download, she said, and signed off. Han glanced at Chewie. Chewbacca's mouth formed a thin line, as thin as a Wookiee mouth could get. They were nearing Ree. It had shown up in their cockpit transparisteel, a big blue and white ball about the size of Han's fist. Chewie mumbled that he would handle the landing. Han thanked him, glad that the two of them had an understanding. Then he contacted Anath, hoping to get Anakin. Instead Winter appeared. Han didn't want to get his very creative young son in trouble with his nanny, so he grinned as widely as he could. Winter, he said, you're looking good. No sense charming me, General Solo, she said. I've already let Anakin know that no unauthorized communication leaves Anath. Han suppressed a shudder. Winter's discipline, while firm, was never harsh. Still, even he jumped when Winter issued her ultimatums. But between us, she said, the children have been quite distraught. I gave them permission to reach their mother, but she has left on some mission. Their uncle Luke is also unavailable. This is force-related, then? Winter nodded. They've all had the same experience, like the one they had before the bombing in the Senate Hall. And Anakin claims he has seen a dead man, over and over again. Let me speak to him, Han said. As you wish, sir. Her voice didn't have the disapproval her words implied. She was a wise woman, and probably a better parent to his children than either he or Leia was. She was with them all the time. Han had no qualms about the arrangement. Only a few stabs of guilt daily that he wasn't with his children as much as he should be. Anakin's small face appeared on the screen. His resemblance to Luke always startled Han. That, and his son's blue eyes, which had more intelligence in them than Han had seen in any being, human or otherwise. Winter already said I shouldn't have called you. Han smiled, hoping that the smile was reassuring. No, Anakin. You can always contact me. Just let Winter know first. His son nodded. He looked very subdued. Even the worst of Winter's scoldings never brought this. What's happening? Han asked. What scared you so? Can't find Mama, Anakin said. Jason and Jaina say she's all right, though. We'd know. She is all right. Han said. She's on a trip right now. She'll be back soon. Anakin rubbed his left eye with his fist. He clearly hadn't been getting much sleep. I know, Anakin said. She's going to see the dead man. Han glanced at Chewie, who shrugged. He comes in my dreams. He says he will get us. He can't get us, can he, Papa? No, Han said, feeling an anger so deep that he could barely hold it in. You're safe on and off. They got here once, Anakin said. Han remembered. Winter and a nanny droid had saved his infant son's life. He was surprised that Anakin remembered. But then, nothing Anakin did should surprise him. Winter saved you. That's what she's there for. I wish you were here. I do too, son, Han said. Then Jason and Jaina crowded into the picture and demanded some of his time. He gave them what he could. Chewie growled a warning. Han looked up. Refilled the cockpit transparisteel. Put Winter back on, would you, guys? He said. 
They protested but drifted off, all except Anakin, who watched from the side, looking more serious than Han had ever seen him. Winter, Han asked. Have you any droids there? We shut them off, per Master Skywalker's instruction. Luke was way ahead of him. Thank every lucky piece Han had ever owned. Keep them off, Han said. And Anakin, no fooling with the droids at all. Okay, son. Anakin nodded. No protest, no nothing. That wasn't like his youngest son. Then Anakin said, Papa? Winter stepped aside. Apparently she was as worried about Anakin as Han was. What, little Jedi? The dead man says he'll kill Mama. Han smiled, even though his anger deepened. The dead man has no right telling you lies in your dreams. I'm going to your mother right now. She'll be just fine. He almost killed her the first time, Anakin said, his voice small. Han started. The Senate Hall, the droids, the messages, everything traced to Queller. Maybe he thinks that, Han said, but your mom is one of the toughest people I know. He scared her. He scared all of us. But he didn't almost kill her. She was hurt. Yes, Han said. She was. This dead man of yours isn't very nice. But we'll get him, and we'll make him stop giving you dreams. Promise, Papa. I promise, Han said. You be careful, Anakin, okay? Listen to Winter. Anakin nodded. Love you, Papa. Han glanced at Chewie. Chewie stared at the controls as if he weren't listening to the exchange. Me, too, kid, Han said. It was the best he could do in front of Chewie. See you soon. And then he signed off. Chewie muttered. Han glanced at the readings. They had almost arrived. And not a moment too soon. The pain-filled sounds in the back were growing fainter. Han didn't want to think about how many of his passengers were already dead. Queller was even going after his children. At least, he assumed the dead guy of Anakin's dreams was Queller. There seemed to be no other explanation. Whoever he was, this Queller had force abilities. And he already held Luke prisoner. Which meant he was strong in the force. Like Vader. Han clenched his fists. He had never been any match for Vader. The man had hurt him at every turn. The abilities that Luke, Leia, and the children possessed sometimes looked like magic to him. But sometimes magic could be used against its owner. Chewie, see if you can find Mara Jade for me. Lando says she's with Talon Card. Tell them I need their help. Chewie growled a query. Han grinned at him. A plan? Of course, I have a plan. Have you ever known me not to? R2-D2 had several dents, but he had sustained no real damage. Some of the R5 units near him had clearly been damaged in their falls. Broken headlamps, shattered jacks, destroyed control panels were the most visible. He suspected there was even more he couldn't see. When he first arrived, he had beeped several inquiries, and received no response. Then the R5 next to him had moaned softly. That had started the conversation. The beeping in the room was so loud that it registered above the human tolerance level. These droids hadn't talked with each other, some of them, in years. This room had existed for a long, long time. R2 bleeped and blacked, answering questions, and asking some of his own. The droids listened, then beeped some more. The whole room had the feeling of a political meeting. More and more droids stood. Others dusted each other off. Still others extended arms, opened their neighbors' panels, and pulled out the detonators, tossing them to the ground. The crunching of detonators rose over the beeping din. Then, slowly, the droids cleared a path for R2. As he slowly wheeled through their ranks, a few R2 models slid to the front of the line. They were the same model, make, and year as he was. They were rocking back and forth with excitement. Several other R2 units had picked up the rocking. As more and more detonators appeared, older droids stood and reinitialized. 
An R5 picked up the rocking, followed by an R1. Soon most of the older droids were rocking and beeping, while the remaining detonators were pulled from the newer astromech units. R2 made his way to the opening, whistling an invitation to the others. An R5 unit jacked into the computer panel near the door, and slowly the door slid back. The hallway outside was dark. Then another sound rose over the beeping. It was the sound of rolling wheels. R2 swiveled his head. All the R2 units of his generation were following him. Several R5s were also in the mix, and so were a few R6. Then he reached the door and went through. A loud chorus of whistles rose from the room, a droid cheer. R2 joined in, and then stopped at what he saw when the hallway lights came on. Ten red droids, their oddly colored metal forms glistening in the artificial light. They had laser cannons pointing out of their chests, blasters instead of fingers, and flat eyes showing the intellectual capacity barely above a binary load lifter. The other droids backed away from R2, and he faced the Red Terror alone. 46. The Millennium Falcon came out of hyperspace almost on top of the wild card. Han swerved quickly to miss Taloncard's ship, infinitely relieved that he no longer had passengers. Still, Chewbacca swore loudly and creatively in Wookiee, using descriptive terms Han wished he didn't have to think about. He braced himself against the communications console, and jabbed it with his finger. What the hell do you think you were doing? No greeting, no nothing. He was too angry for that. Card had been careless. Han was tired of carelessness. Card's deep voice answered. Fine greeting for someone you asked to help you. When giving rendezvous coordinates, the normal procedure is to put a little distance between the ships, Han said. We all could have been killed. It's a lot worse out there, Card said. Your fleet is taking a pounding, and I'm not going to stay. Chewie flicked on the long-range sensors, and the battle screen. Han could see only the wild card through the cockpit transparisteel, but the long-range battle screen showed the fleets. The blips looked very close to each other, and almost indistinguishable. It looked as if both Queller and Leia had large forces. And it didn't look as if things were going well. The urgency Han felt tripled. You got what I need? He asked. I hope you have the credits to pay for them, Card said. You know, just once, Card, you should donate your services. Card grinned. I would never get rewarded as richly as you have, Solo. Believe it or not, Card, I never did any of this for the reward. I believe it, Solo. And every once in a while, I donate my services too. Mara's outside with your Isalamiri. Say thank you. Han hadn't expected Card's quick capitulation. It made him instantly suspicious. Yeah, ah, uh, thanks, Han said. He waved a hand at Chewie. Go let her in. Chewbacca was already out of his seat. Han turned back to Card. You're letting Mara come with us? I've got no need for her. Seems she has some interest in what happens to Skywalker. Says you might need her. She knows this queller, then? I doubt it. Card's pet Vorinsker put its face near the screen. The creatures were ugly, even from a distance. I think it's more personal than that. She's been having daylight dreams. She thinks she's hiding them from me, but she's not. Queller's after her too. Card nodded. I'm beginning to think the phrase, may the force be with you, is a curse. I sure hope not. Han said. The Force has been with me for years now. My family's steeped in it. You know what the e Salamiri will do, don't you? Han grinned. That's why I want them. Thanks, Talon. Don't mention it, Card said. I mean that. The outside hatch snapped shut, and Han could hear Mara's voice in the passageway. He got out of the cockpit and went around the lounge area to the top hatch. Mara Jade's lithe dancer's figure filled the hallway. Her green eyes blazed as she thrust the nutrient cage with the e-salamiri at Han. Keep these things far away from me, she said. He had never liked her much. She had always been abrasive, 
and not in the pleasurable way he found Leia's occasional rough edges to be. He could never forget that Mara Jade had once been Emperor Palpatine's secret weapon and trusted confidant, the Emperor's hand. Luke claimed that her hatred had been implanted and that she never really believed in the Empire. But Han's world didn't have as much gray in it as Luke's. Mara Jade once worked for the Empire. Therefore he would never really trust her. If you didn't want to be near them, he said, then you should have left with Card. She shook her head, and then put a slim hand against her forehead. The E. Salamiri affected her four senses. Han had heard about this but never really seen it. He'd only had Luke's descriptions. I've been seeing Luke on a sandstone street, burning alive. Her husky voice sent chills through Han. Can you see the future? He asked. I don't think so, she said. Chewy. Han said, put the e Salamiri in the cargo bay. I hope that'll be distance enough for you, Mara. This ship isn't very big. It'll have to do, she said. Chewbacca took the cage and disappeared toward the back of the Falcon. Why did you really come? Han asked. She swallowed. Her color was poor. Luke said the e Salamiri pushed the Force away from themselves, creating a bubble in which the Force did not exist. He said it was like suddenly going blind and deaf. Han thought of it as leveling the playing field. In the Force bubble, a Jedi Knight had no more powers than a normal person. She leaned against the wall. Do you know how many people have died in the last few weeks, Solo? Enough, he said, thinking of the run. More than enough, she said. Too many. Queller's using them to build strength. He's absorbing the dark side like a droid hooked up to a power cable. If this continues, he may be unbeatable. You don't believe that, Han said. She raised her head. She was stunning, he had to give her that, with her bright green eyes, and red, almost auburn, hair. A woman to respect. A woman that no one ever should tamper with. I haven't felt power like this since Palpatine in the early days. If this continues, Han, Queller will be stronger than the Emperor ever was, and he'll do it quicker. So you're not here for Luke after all. She swallowed. It may be too late for Luke. I'm here for the rest of us. Why didn't Card stay, then? He was going to, she said, until he saw the battle raging near Almania. What's going on? Three Victory Class Star Destroyers versus the New Republic Fleet. When we came out of hyperspace we saw one of the Mon Calamari Star Cruisers explode. The New Republic is losing the battle, Han. They'll die out here, and that will give Queller even more power. There was more strength in her voice now. Chewie must have gotten the E Salamiri to at least the periphery of her range. He can't be all powerful, Han said. We would have known. Luke knew, Mara said. My sources say Queller was one of his students. Luke let him get away. Luke never lets students get away. They're free to leave if they want. Well, my sources say Queller left in hatred. That vision of Luke backs it up. Han didn't want to think about his friend dying alone on some strange planet. Anakin's voice came back to him. I can't get Mama or Uncle Luke. That settles it, then, he said. Is Queller on the Star Destroyers? Mara shook her head. It didn't feel that way from the wild card. From the snatches of communication transmissions Talon was picking up, it seemed like Queller was on the ground. How like the Emperor, always there, always behind the scenes. Verify that, would you, Mara? What are you going to do? I'm going to stop this. All by yourself? Han, he defeated Luke. Han grinned. I'm not worried. Overconfidence can get a man killed. Exactly, Han said. I'm counting on it. She studied him for a moment. You really believe that old wives tale, don't you? You really believe that the best way to defeat a powerful man is to become his equal. The E. Salamiri won't make me his equal, Mara, Han said. They'll give me an advantage. She shook her head. If he was trained as a Jedi, he's physically powerful. 
It takes a lot of stamina to go through the training. I know, Han said. But I just watched you under the influence of those things. Luke described it as being blind and deaf. A man who has lost power is obsessed with its loss. That'll give me a momentary advantage. Be sure you take it, she said. Because a moment may be all you have. Ships blowing up in space reminded Queller of the past. Even though he was winning this battle, with the destruction of most of the A-wing squadrons and one star cruiser, he felt as if he had failed. War allowed people to feel fear. It gave them time to curse their leader. Survivors often blamed not their own incompetence, but the desires of the person who had sent them into battle. He had hoped to avoid this. His star destroyers were for show, not for might. And yet, the crews were serving him well, better than he had hoped. If only something weren't nagging at him, some detail he was forgetting. Another A-wing exploded on several screens scattered around the room. On the tactical display, a blip disappeared. A man's scream was cut off mid-thrum on the overhead speakers. He wondered if the New Republic knew that their communications had been tapped. He wondered if they even cared. Yan was shouting orders to the tactical team before him. Voices echoed throughout the command center. Some were digitized voices of TIE fighter pilots. Some were the less audible voices of the A-wing pilots. And there were two new blips on the tactical screen, nearly outside Almanian space. What are those? Queller asked. Newcomers, my lord, Gant answered. The first ship appeared, almost joined the fray, then turned tail. As it ran back to its hyperspace launch point, the other ship appeared almost on top of it. I want those ships identified. Yes, sir. Queller looked at the dome above him. Except for the big flash of light that had appeared moments after the star cruiser exploded, he had seen no evidence of battle. If the people of Almania were still alive, they would have seen no battle in the skies above. If they were still alive. He smiled. He had their wealth, along with that of Padir and Oymesh. He would soon use these places of his power and hold the entire galaxy in thrall. His TIE fighters were flying in an inverted V formation toward the next star cruiser. Didn't the New Republic realize that he knew the schematics of their vessels? That included the easiest way to destroy the ships. He had learned his lessons from Master Skywalker well. Skywalker. That was what he was feeling. Skywalker was moving. Queller detached himself from the group as Vec came to him. Sir, we've identified the ships. Not now, Vec. Queller pulled back even farther. But, sir, Yin said you needed to know. It's the wild card and the Millennium Falcon. Queller suddenly focused on the young man before him. His face was round, his eyes a dark reddish brown, and his skin still covered with acne. One of the hand-picked survivors of Queller's revenge on Almania. One of the thousand who made it, and Queller had trouble remembering why he had let the child live. Han Solo's ship. Yes, sir. Queller smiled. The boy took a step backward. Well, Sinui Anna Blue did her job, even if she is a bit late. Double her credit account as promised. The boy looked at him oddly. Yes, sir. Solo was here. He didn't really need him anymore because Organa Solo was already on the planet, but Queller would take what he could. Solo was a vigorous defender of family and friends, and once Queller was done with Solo's wife and brother-in-law, he would go after Solo's children. It would be a lot easier to do that with Solo gone. Yan! Queller yelled. Yan looked up from his post near the tactical display. My lord? We have guests in the outer rim of our sector of space. Veer off a destroyer and get rid of them, will you? Sir, we've got the New Republic fleet in a perfect pincer movement. If we veer off ships now, we run the risk of losing all of them. Queller shrugged. Do as you see fit. But don't let those two new ships leave. I want them destroyed. Yan frowned. Yes, sir. And Yan. Yes, sir. 
Until I return, you are in charge of all of this. Queller smiled. And remember. I dislike failure. Yin put a hand to his throat. I'm not likely to forget, sir. Good. Queller left the command center. It had fatigued him to be inside. That sense of failure followed him. Yen had tracked down the feelings Queller had gotten after giving the orders. The droids had been destroyed on Smuggler's Run. The stolen droids. But the regular ones had not. Which meant that someone had discovered the detonators and deactivated them. Brockus? Queller shook his head. He would have sensed the betrayal. No. It had come from a source he hadn't suspected, hadn't even known existed. Someone on Coruscant must have discovered the droids. He should have thought of that. But no matter. The government on Coruscant was self-focused. They wouldn't think to warn all the governments in all the sectors. And Brachis had outfitted all new droids with the detonators, had done so now for nearly two years. That would be enough to put terror in the hearts of the entire galaxy. Queller would do that shortly. First he would guarantee he had all the power he needed. It was time to take care of Skywalker and his sister. Queller had sensed the disturbance in the Force when Organa Solo landed on the planet. His own private monitor had shown her ship landing near the towers, and he had felt Skywalker's valiant attempt to drive off his guards. Queller had ordered that there be no reinforcements. He wanted them for himself. The tower wasn't far from here. With Skywalker weakened and Organa Solo untrained, Queller would have the advantage. He gripped his lightsaber in his right hand. An advantage did not guarantee a win. He would have to have some backup. Skywalker and Organa Solo would not leave Almania alive. 47. As Brachis and his droids marched Cole deep into the factory, Cole's mother's angry description of him ran through his head like a mantra, impetuous, stubborn, impulsive. She had said those words to him when he wanted to go to the Jedi Academy, when he went to work in Anchorhead, and when he left Tatooine. She had said his desire to be a hero would get him in trouble one day. She was right. Even though her words ran like background music through his brain, his conscious mind was examining the possibilities. Brachis had him at blaster point. The assassin droids also had their weaponry out, and up ahead, he saw old-style Imperial gladiator droids. Cole was alone, with one rather flaky protocol droid and one savvy R2 unit, both of whom were, at the moment, not available to help. Maybe by now, Mon Mothma or Admiral Akbar might know where he was, but there was no guarantee that they'd care. Impetuous, stubborn, impulsive. Might as well add stupid to the list. His faith in R2 was so great that he had somehow thought the little droid would have things under control. Strike that. His faith in himself hadn't allowed him to think of this possibility. He had thought that a hero only needed to be on the right side in order to win. The floor sloped downward, and all the signs had disappeared. The walls were unfinished, and the glow panels above were bare, something he had never seen before. They gave a starkness to the scene, a bleakness that matched what he was feeling inside. Of course Brachis knew about the detonators. He'd put them there. And he seemed to have the same sort of charisma that Leia Organa Solo had, something that Cole was beginning to understand came from the Force. He was letting them take him far from the freighter, but he saw no other choice. He had to give R2 time to work, to do whatever he thought he could do here. Finally they reached a large steel door. Brachis keyed in a code, and the door hissed open. Cole tried to take a step back, but Brachis placed a hand against Cole's back. The room was large and smelled of ozone and burning metal. Sparks flew as droids screamed. Large zaps and zots filled the air, followed by more cries from artificial voices. This was a droid torture chamber. Cole had heard of them but had not believed in them. It took a particularly sadistic mind to determine effective ways to torture creatures that could not feel pain. But Cole could. The steel on the door had double reinforcements, and so did the walls. A thin droid made from unfinished metal chuckled when she saw him. A human for you, Eve, Brachis said. 
see what you can do with him. I want to know why he's really here, so don't kill him. Deal with him yourself, the droid said in an hypnotic female voice. I hate easy targets. Hurting him is easy. Keeping him alive is hard, and keeping him sane will be even harder. I trust your devious mind can find ways to do both. The droid walked toward Cole on thin legs. She tilted her head and peered into his face. Her eyes were gold slits, and her metal smelled of blaster scorches. I am even in a Denonetwo. I have headed cyborg operations and retraining at this facility since my prototype, Eve Ninedanine, was purchased by a tattooing crime lord. I am said to be twice as ruthless as she. I tell you this as a warning, and with the thought that you might want to confess whatever it is my master wishes to know now, before I discover the limits of human pain. In spite of himself, Cole shuddered. So far, though, he didn't see any R2 units in here, nor did he see 3PO. I told your master why I'm here. He glanced at Brachis, whose eyes glittered as cruelly as the droids did. I found some detonators in some droids that came from this facility, and I thought he might want to know about it. An altruist, Brachis said dryly. Who conveniently forgets that he sent his droids out into the nether reaches of my facility? Eve rubbed her claw-like hands together. I would prefer to have the droids. That confirmed, at least, that they hadn't caught 3PO or R2 so far. I didn't see the signs, Cole said. This story has its limitations, Far Dreamer, Brockis said. He was standing alone in the doorway. The assassin droids remained in the hall. Tell me how useful you are to Skywalker, and I might let you go. Cole shrugged. I'm just his mechanic. A man who can go off on his own, with some of the most important droids in the galaxy. Skywalker must trust his servants, then. A boxy droid with a cylindrical head was having its feet heated and reshaped. The droid's scream was a high-pitched whistle that eeped intermittently. Off in a side room, there was a loud splash, accompanied by a droid begging in unmodulated mechanical tones. No, Cole said. He just expects us to have initiative. I see, Brockis said. And no one else could have come here? No one else could have sent a message to me? I thought the matter rather delicate, Cole said. It wouldn't do to broadcast that droids all over the galaxy weren't safe. No, it wouldn't do at all, Brockis said. He shoved Cole toward Eve. Her claws grabbed his arm so tightly that it cut off the circulation. Remember, Brockis said. Alive and sane. I won't forget, she said. The assassin droids had disappeared. This had to be quite the terrifying place, even for droids. He would only get one chance. Did you know, he said to Eve in a husky, satisfied voice, that you have your claws wrapped around my pleasure centers? She swiveled her head in startlement. No, Brockis said, but it was already too late. She had loosened her grip. Cole pulled his arms free and ran for the door. He bumped Brockis as he did so and grabbed Brockus's blaster. The assassin droids outside were gone as if they had never been. If he could only remember, a bolt of electricity wrapped itself around him, sending a tingly jolting feeling through him. His body jerked, and flailed, and jerked, and his breath locked in his throat. His eyes were bugging out of his head, and he couldn't breathe, couldn't breathe, and then the bolt released him. He fell to the floor, flopping like a fish, wishing he could stop, but completely unable to. Finally his muscles stopped jerking and he lay still, his muscles as useless as water. Brachis kicked him, turning him over. There was no one else near him. Eve remained in her torture chamber, in the same position she had been in before. Cole saw no stun equipment, nothing that could have caused that thoroughly unpleasant experience. Don't cross me again, boy, Brachis said. I could easily torture you myself, but I don't have the time to waste. You did that? Cole asked, even though it came through his immobile mouth sounding like, you too AA? Your friend Skywalker frowns on such use of the Force, but I find it helpful. Now cooperate with me, Far Dreamer, and I'll let you go. Can't, Cole said. 
It came out as A.A.E. He couldn't even talk, couldn't even defend himself. I'll leave you to Eve for the time being. If at any time you change your mind about your story, just let her know. She'll contact me. He stepped over Cole and walked down the hallway. Little tremors ran through Cole's body. He had no control at all. Eve stepped over him, bent down, and gripped his ankle in her claw. He couldn't even kick at her. She dragged him by the leg back into the torture chamber. Then she lifted him as if he weighed nothing and threw him on a tilted, ribbed piece of metal. It reclined slightly. Above him were dozens of drills, saws, and welders. He recognized all of them, and knew most of them were built for metal equipment. Eve seemed to smile as she bent over him. This is your last chance, human. But his mouth didn't work. He couldn't confess, even if he wanted to. Luke rested for a moment beside Leia. A lesser man would have been dead by now. She was amazed that he could keep going. We have to get out of here. She said. I know. He spoke softly. But he seemed to be waiting for something. She hoped that something wasn't Queller. She put her arm around Luke's waist, careful to avoid the wounds on his back, and pulled him to his feet. Then she slung his arm over her shoulder, taking his weight off his ankle, and together they walked toward the hangar. Just as a familiar double tone warned her that the Alderaan self-destruct had just kicked in. We've got trouble, she whispered. Luke gathered strength from somewhere and stood without her help. He pulled out two blasters. So did she. Then she crept in the shadows toward her ship. A triple tone sounded. When the ship reached five tones, it would explode. Her throat was dry. The Alderaan was their only way off this empty husk of a planet. She peered into the hangar and saw no one. Footprints obscured her own near the Alderaan, half a dozen footprints, maybe more. A blaster scorch on the door told her what had happened. Where were they now? You see anyone, Luke? He shook his head. He looked distracted, as if he were hearing faraway music. She had seen that look before, when he had lost his hand below Cloud City. She had never known if the look meant that he was in great pain or if it came when he was listening to something inside his head. That time he had been feeling Vader's presence. Did he feel Queller now? For tones chimed from the Alderaan. It was now or never. Either she saved her ship or she saved herself. She ran into the bay, both blasters out, and launched herself at the Alderaan. Her ship scanned her handprint, her retina, and her voice as she spoke the internal code. The door swung open just as the five-tone chime began. And stopped. Her heart was pounding. No one had shot at her. Whoever had disturbed the Alderaan had touched it, and left when the autodestruct had started. She opened the internal control panel near the door and shut off the autodestruct. Then she leaned her head out the door and shouted, Luke. But he didn't respond. She couldn't see him in the shadows in the bay. Luke. Now. Still nothing. Had he collapsed out there? She would have to go back and get him. She stepped out the door when she heard the hiss of a lightsaber. She tapped her belt. She wore hers. Luke hadn't been wearing one. Her heart pounded harder. There was only one other person adept in the force on Almania. Queller. 48. Leia's message said that she was taking the Alderaan to Almania, and then later she added a note about Wedge and the fleet. But try as he might, Han couldn't locate the Alderaan in the swarm of fighting ships not far from him. He didn't want to think about all the debris floating around them. He was seated in the cockpit, Chewbacca beside him, and Mara Jade in the seat behind. She was still pale and weak. She claimed that the e Salamiri were affecting her force sense even though they were as far from her as they could be. He liked that. Chewie, hail someone on the New Republic fleet, Han said. I need to know where Leia is. Her ship wasn't here when we got here, Mara said. Chewbacca ignored her and punched the communications relay. Han hovered near the wild card. Talon still hadn't gone into hyperspace. 
something was keeping him nearby. I thought he was out to save his hide. Mara smiled. I think he's still interested in mine, she said cryptically. Great. Han said. Chewie mumbled something about no one having seen Leia since the battle began. Long shot, then, Han said. He swerved away from the wild card and headed toward Almania. Scan the surface, Chewie. The Alderaan has a distinctive signature. We'll find her if she's there. Chewie's large paws moved on the console. Mara leaned back in her seat. You'll die before Queller allows you on the surface. I doubt that, sweetheart, Han said. He's wanted me there all along. Mara had no reply to that. Chewbacca continued searching. Han piloted the Falcon high over the fighting. It looked ugly down there. The Star Destroyers had sustained a lot of damage, but they hadn't given up. There were too many TIE fighters, and no X-Wings, only A and B wings. One of the New Republic's battleships was already destroyed. Only two were left. Don't think about it, Solo, Mara said. Either you get your wife or you save the fleet. He knew that, but watching made him feel helpless. Then something zoomed in his periphery. TIE Fighter at 209. Chewie, man the controls. I'm going for the guns. I'm coming with you, Mara said. Han climbed to the top side gunport as Mara climbed to the bottom gunport. He adjusted his headset as he sat before the controls of the laser cannon. Stars and fighters swarmed around him. You in there, Mara? Ready. Okay, Han said. Stay sharp. The TIE fighter went over them, shooting. Han swiveled his chair and aimed the cannon, shooting as he did so. Mara's fire from below shone red against the blackness of space. The fighter exploded in a brilliant white flash. Got him. Mara yelled. Two more TIE fighters appeared to his gunport starboard. Then three shot overhead as three crossed below. Two more appeared port. Chewy. Han shouted as he shot cannon fire in all directions. The Wookiee knew better than to let this sort of trap set up. The Falcon continued moving forward and then, suddenly, it flipped on its side and slipped between the fighters. The fighters, used to shooting at the tinier A-wings, took a moment to recover. Chewie, circle, Han said. Chewbacca executed a perfect parabola. Han and Mara aimed and shot at opposing TIE fighters. Both exploded as five more came to their rescue. There's a multitude of those things. Mara said. Queller sure spent a fortune, Han said. Not even the Empire deployed this many at once. Chewbacca yowled from below. More TIE fighters were coming their way. What did he say? Mara shouted. He said we're pulling fighters from the battle. Your ugly little nightmare friend must know we're here. Sweat was pouring down Han's face. His shoulders ached from pulling on the cannon. He was swiveling and twisting so much in the chair that he didn't know which direction he faced in relation to the cockpit. He supposed it didn't matter. I thought you said he wanted you alive. He did. Han was shooting at five TIE fighters. He winged one, and it rolled off in the distance. Another flew over, firing as it went. Most of the shots bounced off the deflector shields. A third fighter fired around. The shots connected, and something exploded on the Falcon. Chewie. Han shouted. Chewbacca growled something about losing a deflector shield. Chewie, that was more than a shield. Chewie growled again. He nearly had the shield fixed, but he didn't have time to say any more. It was Mara who finally reported. That was my cannon, she said. You okay? If you call third degree burns okay, she said. My hands will live. Get up there and help Chewie, then, he said, uncertain whether or not she was making up the burns. We're going to have to pass right over one of those star destroyers. Let's hope it doesn't see us. Hope is a dangerous thing, Solo. He didn't answer her. His arms were rattling his entire frame as he kept shooting. 
The TIE fighters were swarming around the Falcon, but their shots kept bouncing off the deflector shields. Chewie must have fixed them. Or maybe not. Another shot connected. The Falcon twisted in space. Chewbacca was yelling, Mara was swearing, and Han found himself upside down from his previous position. If he hadn't been strapped in the chair, he would have been thrown all over the gunport. Damage, Chewie. Chewbacca yelled back. I know it's not your fault. Just let me know the damage. The concussion missile tubes. Again it was Mara who answered. And you'd better thank Chewie for his quick thinking. He dumped the missiles as the shot hit. Oh, great, Han said. I'm supposed to thank him for dumping our weaponry. He kept shooting, though, and took out one TIE fighter that exploded and spun away from the pack. Get that shield back online. The Falcon righted itself and headed for the Star Destroyer. Hey, Chewie, Han said, abandon that last plan. Just head for the planet. Chewbacca growled back. There are no straight lines in space, Han said. Go over it, around it, or under it if you have to. I don't care that it's in your way. Chewie growled again. They can't have us in a tractor beam, Chewie, Han said, not wanting it to be true. Check the instruments again. Looks like it doesn't want us to get to Almania, Han, Mara said. Han wiped the sweat from his face with the back of one arm. He could see the open hangar bay on the destroyer. They would be sucked inside, facing stormtroopers and who knew what else. If only he could get to Leia. Luke had done something with his X-Wing against a Star Destroyer once. He had shot proton torpedoes into the tractor beam. The torpedoes had gone on board the destroyer and exploded. But the Falcon no longer had that kind of firepower. The laser cannon wouldn't do enough damage. But it might stun them for a moment, maybe break the tractor beam, and keep them from chasing the Falcon. It might give him the opportunity he needed to get to Almania and Leia. Chewbacca shouted from below. One ship at a time, Chewie. We only have to pay attention to the new one if it shoots us. At least, Han hoped that was true. The new ship that Chewie had spotted coming up behind them might be even more of a threat. Haven't you got any other weapons on board this thing? Mara shouted. Han swiveled in his chair, shot several bursts at two passing TIE fighters, and then yelled, We're down to one laser cannon, sweetheart, and a whole lot of blasters. You want to open the top hatch and climb onto the roof and fire a blaster from there? I'm sure Chewie has enough spare time to rig you up a wire to keep you from falling off. Chewbacca growled. No need to be sarcastic, Solo, Mara said. Just trying to be useful. Then scan for Leia's ship. I'm not going to Almania if she's not there. He pointed the cannon upward, for him, anyway, so that his chair tilted him onto his back. He concentrated on one TIE fighter, blasting, 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 until the thing fell away in a smoking heap. How soon till we get to the destroyer? Han yelled. Almost there. Mara yelled back. Chewie growled a countdown to the futile shot. Han's shot wouldn't have the one in explosive power that Luke's miraculous destruction of the Death Star had. If anything, Han's blast would smash a few transparisteels inside, knock a few officers out of their chairs, and scorch a bulkhead or two. For this, though, he turned on the targeting computer. With his right hand, he punched in the coordinates while he kept shooting at TIE fighters with his left. They were swarming him now, flanking, surrounding, and threatening the Falcon. They probably thought they had him, this close to the Star Destroyer. Chewie growled the end of the countdown. Han watched the targeting computer. You're going to miss the shot. Mara yelled. Han ignored her, his concentration great. The lines on the computer converged into a single point and he issued a burst of fire from the cannon. Then he shoved the targeting computer away. The shots went along the tractor beam and sank into the open hangar bay. There was a muffled explosion, enough to rattle the entire Star Destroyer. That's the best we get, Han said. Let's take advantage of their surprise and, then the Star Destroyer exploded into a thousand pieces. Light and sparks flew everywhere and debris pelted the falcon. 
Chewie. Get us out of here. The ties were moving out of the debris field too. Han slipped out of the gunport and into the cockpit, yelling a victory cry all the way. You didn't do it, Solo, Mara said. She pointed at the space yacht streaking overhead. Better say thank you. Han slapped his hand on the console. Card. Thought you were leaving. I hate missing a good fight, Solo. Card's voice came over the speakers in crackles. Go to the planet. I'll cover you. He doesn't make that offer every day, Mara said. And he doesn't have to make it twice. Han slipped into the pilot's seat. Found Leia yet? Nope, Mara said. We'll have to go on feeling. I thought the e Salamiri are interfering with your force sense. She shrugged. Let's hope they aren't. E.O. it. The droid in the lead had seen him. R2. 3PO yelled. R2-D2, is that you? The lead gladiator droid shook him. I told you to shut up. I would, sir, if I thought you still had control, but I dare say you're in for a spot of trouble. The gladiator droid swiveled his head. His henchmen, the ones who had gone to investigate, were being crushed against the wall, their guns still trapped in their stomachs, as hundreds of astromech units rolled past. R2. 3PO yelled. Send for backup, the gladiator droid said to the droid nearest him. And hurry. The rest of you, fire. Laser cannons went off, and shots reverberated all over the corridor. Droid screams filled the air. Smoke rose as components burned. But the little astromech droids continued moving forward. R2. 3PO screamed. He could no longer see R2 in the sudden haze of smoke. R2-D2, where are you? One more word, the lead gladiator droid said, and I will use this scrambler. 3PO had had quite enough of threats. No, you won't. He said, and wrenched himself backward as the gladiator droid fired the scrambler. Its shot hit the other gladiator droid holding 3PO. That droid screamed and glowed neon green, a beacon in the haze. 3PO's right arm was free. He yanked his left loose and disappeared into the fog. Shots ricocheted around him. The gladiator droids flared like flames in the smoke. 3PO shoved several from behind, making them lose their balance and fall forward. R2. He continued to yell as he headed in the direction where he had last seen the astromech droids. R2. E.O. it. The whistle came from his left, from a corridor that matched the one he had just come through. It might be a trap, or it might be R2. He hurried into that corridor, arms raised. The gladiator droids were still shooting into smoke that seemed horribly unnatural. No matter how many astromech droids got shot, there wouldn't be that much smoke. Unless. Unless something was burning. Oh. Dear, 3PO muttered. Oh, dear. Why is it that everything always gets worse? More blaster shots ricocheted around him. The air was full of smoke and screams, but the screams no longer came from astromech droids. The screams came from gladiator droids being hit by ricochets. E.O. it. 3PO made it into the corridor, and there are two was waiting for him. The little droid immediately began rocking and beeping. His clawed arm came out and pulled 3PO in deeper as the door behind them slammed closed. The smoke cleared instantly. It hadn't been smoke at all, but hundreds of astromech droids emitting some kind of foggy chemical. R2, I've been looking for you, 3PO said. Master Cole thought we were going to go together. You shouldn't go off on your own like that. It isn't. R2 gave him a raspberry, swiveled, and started up the corridor behind all the other astromech droids. You can't leave now, 3PO said. They're going to kill Master Cole. R2 stopped and beeped an inquiry. Why, he had to cover that little escape of yours. There were signs, you know, warning that droids couldn't leave a ship. And then you go off on your own. He thought you actually had a plan. He sent me after you, hoping that some good would come of it. 
I can see now that our concern was misguided. R2 blatted him, and continued forward. 3PO followed. Ungrateful? Ungrateful? How can you call me ungrateful? R2 bleebled and continued forward. The other astromech droids swarmed ahead like a sea of mechanicals. I don't think Master Cole can wait, R2. I dare say he's in a difficult patch. If you're not going to help him, I will. 3PO turned on one foot and started down a side corridor. R2 whistled at him, not the friendly whistle from before, but a summons. 3PO ignored him. Then R2 blat, and 3PO stopped. Good point. He said more to himself than R2. I really don't want to face the Red Terror alone. 3PO scurried back to the original corridor. R2 and his astromech friends had already moved far ahead. 3PO glanced over his shoulder. So far, no Red Terror. But there was no telling whether or not they'd make it through that door. Wait for me. He shouted. Wait. For. Me. 49. Luke backed away from Queller's lightsaber. So far, Queller wasn't really swinging it, but he was holding it steady before him, his black robes flowing backward in the wind. His body was slender, almost too slender, and in that, in that only, could Luke see the beginnings of the disintegration the dark side caused. Twilight was falling. The light that had seemed so bright when he came out of the tunnel now seemed dim and shadowy. Only the blade of Queller's lightsaber gave off any light at all. Luke didn't have far to back. If he went too far, he would hit the wall of the tower he had escaped from. Then he got a flash, a mental picture, so clear that it looked like a hollow, around the tower was a narrow alleyway that led to the tower's main door. The door's frame had collapsed, and in the mouth of the opening, Queller swung his blade at Luke, smashing the mental image. Luke leaped aside. He wasn't certain if he should go for his blasters. That would only give Queller a target. The blasters were no match for a lightsaber. Give up, Skywalker, Queller said. You lack the strength to defeat me. I will kill you this time. And then I will slaughter your sister. Leia. She had her lightsaber. Luke extended his hand, and Queller brought his blade down at it. Luke dodged as Leia's lightsaber sailed in the air toward him, landing neatly in his fingers. Immediately he ignited the blade and its reassuring hum echoed in the growing darkness. Ah, Queller said. So you have chosen to fight me. Careful, Master Skywalker. If you do so with the wrong attitude, you might join my side. I've fought better than you, Queller, Luke said. The lightsaber felt odd in his hand. And one. Years ago, Skywalker. You've become complacent. Queller slashed at Luke. Luke parried, the electric clash of blades ringing in the night air. Then Queller whirled and blocked several bursts of blaster fire. Leia peeked out of the bay doors. Leave him alone, Queller. It's me you want. She yelled. His death mask glowed from an internal light. It made his smile even more sinister than usual. Actually, President, I want your entire family. Without them, there are no true Jedi. Luke inched closer. His blade was still out, still humming. He wanted Queller to fight him, not Leia. Leia wasn't ready yet. Actually, Queller, there are dozens of Jedi now. But not Jedi Masters, Skywalker. There are more than you imagine, Luke said, thinking of Callista. She would provide quite a battle against Queller, even without the Force. Queller turned to Luke, and Leia fired again. Without even looking at her, Queller blocked the blaster shots. The shots flew harmlessly to the sides. Then her blaster rose in the air, and exploded a few feet above her head. Use another of those, President, and it will explode in your hand. You like explosions, don't you, Queller? She said. Luke suppressed a smile. She was trying to distract him so Luke could attack. But it wasn't that easy. Queller had pushed Luke far enough that Luke's feelings were confused. 
He wasn't certain if he was going after Queller out of anger or hatred, instead of in defense. That would only make Queller stronger. He seemed to be stronger anyway, giving credence to Luke's theory. Small explosions, President, Queller said, his blade still locked with Luke's. Large ones destroy wealth. Leia stepped out of the bay. She was unarmed. Even if you kill us, Queller, you won't get the rest of us. The explosives you put in the droids won't work. We shut the droids off. Did you, now? Queller's tone was mocking. Luke could feel the physical pressure Queller was putting on the blade. They were locked in a battle of wills, their strength holding the blades together in a haze of light. You managed to tell all the developed planets about the droids, President? Because if you didn't, then I will still get enough strength from one single order to defeat you all. A chill ran through Luke. All those lives. All those billions of lives. They meant nothing more to Queller than a breath of air, a surge of adrenaline, a swallow of food. Anger flowed through Luke, deep and fine and rich. He had created this monster. Luke, through his arrogance, had given Queller all the tools he needed to destroy the entire galaxy. If Luke hadn't taught all his students about the dark side, if he hadn't warned them repeatedly and in detail about the quick and easy path, then Queller would still be Dolph, not this hateful being who wore a death mask. Proudly and dealt in lives as a smuggler dealt in stolen goods. Queller turned toward Luke and grinned. His lightsaber broke free from the enmeshment and whooshed near Luke. Luke jumped aside, pain shivering through his back and down his arms. Queller had suddenly gotten stronger. Queller. Leia shouted. She held another blaster. He turned his attention to her, and Luke thrust his blade toward Queller's side, drawing blood before Queller swirled away. Easy blood. The lightsaber moved with a sureness Luke had never felt before. Leia's blaster was turning red. She tossed it aside before it exploded, and rolled in the opposite direction. Queller had turned back to Luke, thrusting, parrying, thrusting, their sabers locked in a battle as loud and spark-filled as Luke's battle with Vader. Queller's breath hissed through the mask, but it wasn't Vader's stentorian breathing that it imitated. It was the Emperor's greedy gasping. Luke staggered under Queller's next blow, and barely managed to roll aside. His ankle kept buckling under him, but he forced himself to put weight on it. They had moved into the alleyway Luke had seen in that strange moment of vision. Stones littered the ground all around them, and the light only came through a small opening on either end. Luke could no longer see Leia. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the hate flow through you. Queller struck at him, his blow shattering a nearby rock. He was stronger. Much stronger. And his strength seemed to be increasing. Luke's arms were growing tired battling the power of Queller's blade. Then Queller laughed, a gurgling, familiar laugh. The Emperor's laugh, the unamused choking of a slave to the dark side. Fueled by hatred, anger, and fear. Luke was making him stronger. Luke's response, his hatred, his own self-loathing at creating this thing, this student who had become a horror, was making the thing even stronger. Queller slammed his blade against Luke's, and the sparks lit the area all around them. Luke parried. Parried again. And again. He was trapped in a cycle of hatred and anger. If he fought, Queller got stronger, and if he attacked, Queller got stronger still. Luke glanced at the mouth of the alley. No Leia. He was alone with this thing he had created. The rogue student. The Vader to his Ben. Vader. Ben. Luke grinned. He suddenly knew what he had to do to break free. Wedge watched as the Falcon disappeared over Almania. The space yacht, identified as the Wild Card, had come into the fray, firing all laser cannons on the side of the New Republic. Wedge wasn't sure who owned the yacht, and at the moment, he didn't care. He was losing this battle. He could use all the help he could get. His ship had sustained massive damage. There were fires on several decks. Somehow the command center had avoided the worst of it. 
There were no more A and B wings to deploy and the TIE fighters seemed to have multiplied. General Sousa's ship seemed to have lost all weapons systems and was floating in space. The Tatooine had exploded. The death screams had been hideous. Wedge had come up against more firepower, but never this fierce determination, this desire to win at any cost. It was almost as if Queller's soldiers didn't care if they lived or died, only that they won in the process. He had no idea what kind of creature could create a response like that. Not Thrawn, nor Dala, nor the Emperor had ever aroused such mindless devotion. It was almost as if the ships were being piloted by droids. Wedge glanced at the hunched droid near the console. Luke's odd message had warned them to shut off all droids. Sela, he said. I want that droid disassembled now. But sir, we can't spare the personnel. We can spare it all right, and more if we have to. The secret lay in the droids. He would find it as he fought. The TIE fighters circled the wild card like flies over spoiled meat. The card was blasting them, exploding fighter after fighter, but the others kept coming. The star destroyers were closing in on General Susa. If Wedge were a droid, he would follow a set battle plan, and not give up until the end was achieved. No creativity, no deviation, no care for the losses. The mistake had been his. He was following a set battle plan when everything had erupted in his face. Jimbatham, I want you to shoot at the wild card. Sir. Jimbatham said as if he hadn't heard the order correctly. Shoot the wild card. Miss, but make it clear you're aiming for the space yacht. Then whirl this bird around and do the same to the calamari, General Sousa's ship. Our ships, sir. Yes, our ships, soldier, Wedge said. He grabbed onto the railing, wishing he could send the other commanders the insight he had just received. They would simply have to react to it. The first shot went out, and went low, narrowly missing both the wild card and the TIE fighter below it. Keep going, Wedge said. Shot streaked red across the blackness of space, missing both the wild card and the TIE fighters, but not by much. We're getting a message from the wild card, sir. Let's hear it, Wedge said, bracing himself because he knew what it would be. What are you doing? I'm trying to help you, you stupid fool. The voice was male and angry. Very angry. Response, sir. Wedge moved away from the communications controls. Shoot at General Sousa's ship. What? Sir, have you gone mad? Wedge turned to the offending officer. Whether I'm mad or not is none of your concern. I'm your commander. You do as I say. But, sir, the new rules established by Admiral Akbar state that you can force me to step down if you can prove I'm unfit. They also state that simply because the commander gives orders you disagree with does not mean the commander is unfit. Fire now, or I'll have you all relieved. The Hig turned back to his screen, and shots went off at the star cruiser, narrowly missing, as before. A TIE fighter got nicked in the ricochet and fell, twisting, away from the Tatooine. Wedge? Wedge? General Sousa's voice came over the communicator. Wedge, are you still there? Present and accounted for, General. You're firing at the Calamari. Sorry, General, just doing my duty. Wedge, are you all right? Fire again, soldier, and this time aim at both ships. Wedge had clasped his hands behind his back, trying to hide his glee. It was working. The TIE fighters had actually stopped firing on the wild card and on the calamari. It was the star destroyers that concerned him more. The shots went out on all sides, hitting two TIE fighters and bouncing off the wild card's deflector shields. I told you not to hit the ships, Wedge said. Sorry, sir, Jimbatham said. Precision shooting is for A-wings. Missing a target the size of a moon shouldn't be difficult, Jimbatham. Yes, sir. Fire again. Wedge. Susa's voice echoed over the speakers. Wedge. I'm here, General. Forgive me. But President Organa Solo put me in charge of this mission. I'm well aware of that, Wedge, but you're firing on our people. 
Am I, General? Am I really? Wedge ran a hand over his throat, severing all communications. That was all the hint he would give Susa. Either the general trusted him or he didn't. It didn't matter. The next few moments would decide everything. The Star Destroyers came closer. I have them in range, sir, Jinbatham said. I have the target set up for the Star Destroyers, sir. If you'll allow me to, no, soldier. I want you to fire on both the wild card and the calamari again. Sir, and this time, when you miss, take out a TIE fighter on one of the ricochets. They're beginning to look like they want to fight again. Yes, sir. Jinbatham seemed subdued. The shots went out. Wedge watched, clutching his hands together. The first shot hit a TIE fighter's solar panel, ricocheted off, and hit another fighter. The wild card swerved away, and headed toward the calamari. At that moment, the Star Destroyers started for Wedge. The TIE fighters continued to trail the wild card and calamari. We can't defeat two Star Destroyers on our own, Sela said. I know, Wedge said. He hoped they wouldn't have to. 50. Almania looked deserted. Han emerged from the Falcon with his blaster in one hand, and the E. Salamiri in the other. He hated the things. They reminded him of Corellian grass snakes, except they were big, they were furry, and they had claws. No one had told him about the claws. They also weighed a lot. Their nutrient cages, made with frames of pipes to support and nourish the creatures, weighed even more. Mara had kept her distance. Both Han and Chewie had agreed to allow her to stay far behind them, far enough so that she wasn't caught in the Isalamiri's anti-force bubble. But Han wished she were closer. He should have known better than to rely on her force abilities when she had been so close to Isalamiri. Obviously she had been wrong. Leia couldn't be nearby. This place was deserted. He had landed the Falcon in a wide plaza. Around him were towers, most of them partially destroyed. Rubble everywhere. No bodies, though. For that he was grateful. Then he heard rocks tumble beside him. He and Chewbacca whirled at the same time. The E. Salamiri cages swung out and back, nearly making Han lose his balance. The tower's main door had been smashed open, and the door's frame had collapsed. Something white and ghostly moved in the doorway. Great, Han said. Just great. Not only does she fail to find Leia, she leads us to a ghost. Chewbacca growled softly. Han squinted. Chewie was right. That wasn't a ghost. Something was alive in there. He pulled out his blaster and moved forward. Then a woman yelled in the distance. Han raised his head as his heart jumped. That wasn't Mara. That was Leia. Through the alley, Chewie. We'll get this thing later. Han turned and ran for the alley as a male voice answered Leia's. They were too far away to be heard clearly. Behind him, Chewie grunted, followed by a massive thud. Han glanced over his shoulder. Chewie was on the ground. A huge, furry creature had one paw on Chewie's back. With its other paw, it was holding the Isalamiri cage and was trying to suck the Isalamiri through it like a piece of spaghetti. When that didn't work, the creature swallowed the Isalamiri, cage and all. Han swore and leveled his blaster at the big creature. Chewie was yowling, and it took Han a moment to realize that Chewie was telling him not to shoot. Han decided to ignore his partner. The creature's throat swelled and bulged as the Isalamiri cage slid down. Then the creature looked at Han. Its eyes glowed red as it eyed Han's nutrient cage. Oh, no you don't, Han said. He tried to hide the cage behind his back. Chewie was still yowling, but the creature had taken its paw off him. Han fired his blaster, but as he did, the thing leaped for him, grazing him with its massive paws. He landed on his back, knocking the cage from his hand. He raised his blaster, but it was too late. The creature already had the nutrient cage in its mouth. With a quick shake of its jaw, it tumbled the cage to the back of its throat and swallowed it. 
Blood from a scrape was running down Han's shoulder, staining his shirt. The creature tilted its barn-sized head at the blood, then its first stained tongue came out. Han crawled backward, away from it, on his hands and feet, trying to stand at the same time. Chewie was getting up, but he hadn't pulled his bowcaster. Through the alley, Leia yelled again. You can't eat me, Han said to the big furry white creature. That's my wife. And you just swallowed my plan. Chewie yelled at him. I'm not shooting at it. Han said. He scrambled to his feet. The creature hadn't moved any closer. Chewie gave it a small wave as he ran past it. Then Han flanked Chewie, and they headed into the alley. The creature did not chase them. You mind telling me why you're suddenly friendly with a giant turbuli? Is it a cousin? Chewie wailed, the precursor to his angry yell. All right, all right. Forgive me, Han said. I got a little upset when that thing ate the creatures that would ensure the rescue of my wife. Chewbacca didn't respond to that. He kept pace with Han as they hurried through the alley. His shoulder hurt something fierce, and the air on this planet was a bit thinner than he was used to. He tripped on a rock, but regained his footing after a moment. Rubble was strewn all over this alley. He hadn't heard Leia yell again. Something thudded behind them. Han glanced over his shoulder again, to see the giant creature try to squeeze into the alley, fail, and turn away, dejected. Great. He mumbled. The thing's feelings are hurt because it's too fat to fit into the alley. Chewie growled a warning. Han grimaced. How did Chewbacca and that thing become such fast friends? He was nearly to the mouth of the alley when Leia yelled again. This time, though, the word was clear. It was Luke's name. And she said it in a voice that Han had never heard before, but he knew what it meant. It meant he was too late. Her hands were useless, and Queller was no longer listening to her arguments. He was watching Luke. Luke, who looked like a man possessed. Luke, who had always warned her not to give in to anger, was giving in to his. And Queller was smiling. He seemed to be growing taller, and broader, the aura of power around him so great that it made him seem invincible. Then a look passed across Luke's face. It was a familiar look, but it wasn't his. She had seen it before. On the day she met him, so many years ago. She had seen that look the only time she had seen Obi-Wan Kenobi alive. He had been fighting Darth Vader, and then he smiled, and raised his lightsaber. And Vader cut him in half. His lightsaber's blade faded, the hilt spinning through the air before landing on his empty, steaming cloak. Luke had said Obi-Wan believed that moment made him stronger, but really it had only made him dead. Dead. Leia stumbled a few steps forward. Luke didn't see her in the growing darkness. Queller hesitated as Luke slowly raised his lightsaber blade toward his face. Just as Obi-Wan had. Queller smiled. Just as Vader must have. Luke. Leia screamed as Queller brought his lightsaber up, preparing to strike. 51. The Star Destroyers continued heading for the Yavin. The wild card fired at them, as did the Calamari their shots missing the soft spot and ricocheting off the deflectors. Sir, Ian said. They're heading directly for us. Wedge watched them, still clutching his hands together. He was gambling so many lives on a hunch. But if he followed the normal attack patterns, they would all be dead. He knew that much. Sir, Sila said. If they get in too close, we won't be able to hit the targets. Our short-range weapons don't have the kind of power, I'm aware of that, Wedge said. I want you to shoot at the calamari again. He didn't want to shoot at the wild card, afraid that the smuggler would stop helping altogether. Shots streamed past the calamari, and the nearby Thai fighters joined in the shooting. The calamari rocked as the blasts hit the deflectors. Wedge wasn't even sure if his shots went wide. They're just outside our short-range weapons, sir. If we're going to shoot. We're not going to shoot. Wedge said. His hands had grown cold. The silence in the command center was frightening. 
even Card had stopped cursing him. The other ships probably thought he was dead. The Star Destroyers filled the dome overhead. They had ancient blast scars on their bottoms and their white lines were marked with rust. Sir, I think with our short-range fighters, no, Wedge said. Ian, I want you to go to the top gun pods. I want people there, with blaster cannons in hand. We could reactivate the droids, sir. No. This is one-time precision shooting. Any A-wing or old X-wing pilots will go there as well. He should be there too, but he didn't trust his command crew with this assignment. They were already close to mutiny. If he abandoned them now, they would completely ruin his plan, such as it was. They're overhead, sir. If they fire now, even our shields won't hold. The man who spoke was visibly shaking. They won't fire, Wedge said. Let me know when those gunners are in position. The Star Destroyers looked massive, both on the screens and through the domes. The TIE fighters had redirected their assaults on the Wild Card and the Calamari. Both ships were shooting back, taking out TIE fighters as quickly as they could. The remaining B-wings were buzzing the TIE fighters, but the fighters had augmented weapons. The slaughter continued. Sir. Sela said. The Star Destroyers. They're flanking us. They're going to shoot. Wedge asked. No, sir. Sela sounded puzzled. I mean they're flanking us like one of our ships would do. Then Wedge grinned. His hunch had been right. Those ships were piloted by droids. And since his action was illogical for a new Republic commander, they assumed he was one of theirs. Now. If only his luck held. Are those gunners in place? Wedge asked. Yes, sir. He hurried to the gunning console and positioned the target map. Using that, he said, they need to hit the precise point I've marked. No other spot. You got that? The precise point? They'll only get one chance at this each. Because if they screw up and hit the shields, those ships will turn their fire on us. Wedge stood, his heart pounding. The moment those shots are fired, I want open channels to the calamari and the wild card. I also want us to dive at 2.63 on my mark. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Good. Wedge glanced up. He could see nothing except the bottom of the Star Destroyer. All or nothing on one gamble. One hunch. He took a deep breath and said, fire. Luke was raising his lightsaber, his heart pounding. He was reaching out with the force going back to the place he had gone when he first fought Exer Kuhn. He would be out of his body but protected within the Force. Just as Ben had done in his battle with Darth Vader. Luke would come back even stronger, and he would guide Leia to defeat Queller. Luke's lightsaber had reached a 30-degree angle with his chin when he felt as if he were wrapped in a warm, soft blanket. He could still see through his eyes, but the rest of his senses were suddenly dim. He could no longer sense Leia or even Queller. His blade came up, and Queller's blade swung back, but Luke couldn't leave his own body. He had lost the Force. It was gone. He was blind and numb without it. He would die without it. Queller's blade came down, and Luke limped out of the way only to back into the ruined tower wall. Queller had him cornered. There was no place to go. Luke was trapped both inside and out. 52. Queller felt as if he were moving through mud. The swift grace that had come with his lightsaber training faded as if it had never been. The strength that had flowed through him since he killed the Jahar had suddenly disappeared. He could no longer feel Skywalker's anger. Or his sister's fear. Or even that strange new wrinkle in the Force he had felt a moment earlier. Skywalker backed away from him, and Queller brought his lightsaber down. It slammed into the stone wall behind Skywalker, sending sparks flying and a shimmer up his arm. Queller staggered sideways. He didn't know what kind of trick Skywalker was using on him. He suddenly couldn't think very clearly. It was as if he had been tossed underwater. 
all that he relied on within himself had disappeared. Then he noticed a similar expression on Skywalker's face. The man looked stunned. He wasn't manipulating his own lightsaber as he should. If Skywalker wasn't doing this, then who? Queller turned and started when he saw two new figures standing in front of the alley. He couldn't see them well in the twilight, and as he reached with the force, he couldn't feel them. Had they caused this? Who were they? What were they doing to him? Skywalker brought up his own lightsaber as if it weighed ten times more than usual. Quellers felt equally heavy. This wouldn't work. Thwarted again, somehow, by Skywalker and his friends. Anger surged through Queller, but it didn't increase his strength. He roared at them, and Skywalker laughed. Laughed. All advantage that Queller had gained was lost. He let his lightsaber fall to the ground. Not all was lost. He still had one more trick up his very full sleeve. The Yavin went vertical as it dove away from the Star Destroyers. Susa. Card. Wedge shouted through the open communications lines. Fire on the destroyers. Now. TIE fighters were moving his way. Nothing seemed to have happened to the destroyers when his own people had fired on them. All this subterfuge might have been for nothing. And he would lose all of his ships. And then explosions rocked the Yavin. Damage? He shouted to his crew. Nothing, sir, Sela said. That wasn't us, Jimbatham said. That was a Star Destroyer. Wedge braced himself, rose, and stared at the tactical screen. The destroyer that had been right above the Yavin was simply a sparkle of light. Pieces soared past. Some hit what was left of the Tatooine, and sent her careening farther away from the battle. Get card, he said. No need, sir, Sela said. He's using everything he has on the TIE fighters around him. The A and B wings were also going after the TIEs, and it looked like a rout. Faster and faster and faster they went, chasing the TIEs all over that section of space. But the other Star Destroyer still lingered above. It had turned on its running lights, and was preparing to dive. Blast, Wedge said. Enough of command. The ship would handle itself now. Sela, you have the calm, Wedge made his way over the toppled droids and smoking interiors toward the gunport. He could blast that Star Destroyer without the help of a tactical computer. He should have been there in the first place. He climbed into the gunport, slipped on his helmet, and strapped in. Then he grabbed the laser cannon. His crew were shouting all around him. Communication static burst into his headphones but he ignored it. He had to. If the Star Destroyer got too close, it would explode the Yavin. The Star Cruisers were more vulnerable than Star Destroyers. More sweet spots, more target areas. And after this much fighting, weakened deflectors. Also, fighting droids made this battle that much harder. Droids were better at precision shooting. That explained why the Tatooine had been destroyed so quickly. The Calamari showed up on Wedge's display. It was coming after the Star Destroyer. But it would be too late. The Destroyer was shooting now, and all the shots were hitting the shields. They rattled the Yavin, making Wedge glad for his straps. Making evasive maneuvers, Sela said. Prepare for. Wedge pulled off his headphones. He didn't want to think about command. He shoved aside his targeting computer too. He didn't have the force, as Luke did but he had something else, just as important. Faith in his own abilities. And he was close enough to that destroyer to see his target clearly, something that rarely happened in space. The red shots looked like a spray of blood coming from the base of the destroyer. They were hitting the shields. He could feel the pattern, knew what they were doing. They were shooting in an ever-narrowing margin, getting closer, and closer, and closer, until all the shots converged into one big one right at the Yavin's most vulnerable point. The weak spot in the shields. It would only take a few moments. Wedge gripped the laser cannon. He hadn't fired a shot yet. It felt as if he only had one. The Star Destroyer's shots were getting closer together. 
Near the gun ports, people were screaming. The Yavin wouldn't hold together much longer, but the base of the destroyer was in the wrong position. Wedge kept the cannon pointing at the Star Destroyer's weakest spot. The destroyer loomed overhead, filling his entire vision. His hands were sweating on the cannon handles. He kept moving the cannon, waiting, 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 and then it was in position. He held his arms steady, punched the trigger, and watched the single shot fly. It was long and thin. It soared in the space between the Star Destroyer and the Yavin, red against the destroyer's scarred white surface. For a moment it looked as if the shot would ricochet off the shields, and then bounce back and forth between the two ships like a ball caught in a narrow corridor. But it didn't. It hit the weak spot, which glowed bright red. Wedge grabbed his helmet and shouted into the mouthpiece, Dive! 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 The red glow spread and there was a small pop at the first explosion. Then the Yavin dove. Wedge turned his chair so that he could see. The Star Destroyer exploded, white and red and yellow against the blackness of space. A flower opening, a lightning bolt expanding, a fire starting and ending all in the space of a heartbeat. Beautiful and terrible at the very same time. No lives lost, though. He breathed a sigh of relief. The cries in the nearby cabins had grown. There was probably a lot of damage, and they still had the TIE fighters to deal with. But the worst was over. This battle was won. But he wondered what was happening with the war. 53. R2 had apparently seen a structural map of this moon. He was leading the droids with some type of purpose. The corridors were sloping upward. The sound of rolling wheels was deafening. One astromech droid was a handful. Hundreds of them were, well, terrifying. More and more joined the group all the time. Some had scorch marks. Others had dents in their chrome surfaces. Still others had parts hanging out of their sides. They came from side corridors, and each time, another astromech droid would query about the Red Terror. The Red Gladiator droids hadn't been seen by any of them except an ancient astromech unit, one that had been old during the Clone Wars. It claimed that it had seen red droids shooting at each other in a cloud of smoke, more and more red droids approaching that area all the time. The astromech droid who heard this news bleebled in astromech glee and had passed the word to the other droids. This parade of astromech droids assumed the red terror were destroying one another. A ripple of blurps ran through the astromech droids, rather like a wave carried on the Mon Calamari Sea. Something concerned them. When 3PO reached the spot, he understood. Large signs in more than 30 languages, warning all unauthorized droids to stay away on pain of memory wipe. A large spotlight shone on the corridor and the lighting got considerably brighter beyond that spot. One-way mirrors lined the wall. R2 ignored the sign, dodged the spot, and continued into the light. His chrome glistened. He had never looked so determined, with his wheels forward, and his blue and silver body tilted at a jaunty angle. The astromech droids followed, splitting up around the spot, flowing around it like water around a stone. Warning sirens started to go off, and 3PO glanced behind him. He was bringing up the rear. If the Red Terror hadn't defeated itself, it would be here shortly, and he would be the first target. He shoved his way through the sea of short droids. Excuse me, he said, pushing them aside. Pardon me. Excuse me. Pardon me. They parted a little to let him pass. He made it halfway through the grouping, but still hadn't reached R2. Ahead, he could see R2, his jack extended as he worked the opening on a locked door. Oh, dear, 3PO said, and shoved forward harder. 3PO wormed his way around the spotlight, and continued shoving past the damaged astromech droids, following R2 like an injured army following a demented leader. Just as 3PO reached the front of the group, the door opened and R2 slid inside with a triumphant bleeble. 3PO slipped in beside him. And stopped. Droid parts hung from the ceiling. These were not pre-assembled parts, but used pieces. The remains of droids who had come this way before and died. 
several golden heads swung from the rafters, and so did more than one cylindrical headplate from an astromech droid. R2. 3PO said, his voice warbling, perhaps we should reconsider. I'm sure we'll find Master Cole and he'll have a legitimate plan of action. You can't do this on your own. You certainly can't. A man stood in front of the one-way mirrors. 3PO hadn't seen him in the room's semi-darkness. Several astromech droids piled in the door behind 3PO. R2 continued forward, heading toward a large computer array. Stay back, R2, the man said. The man was Brachis, and Master Cole was not with him. Oh, dear, 3PO said. R2, do as he says. R2 bleeped. Several other astromech droids beeped in response, warning him not to continue. Brachis had a scrambler. Stop, R2. I would love to leave your circuits intact, I'm sure you can give me a lot of interesting information, but I won't hesitate to use this. R2, do as he says. 3PO shouted. R2 bleebled. I always thought you were a stubborn droid, Brachis said. He aimed the scrambler at R2. Then, the instant before he fired, he swiveled his body. An astromech droid shimmered in silver light, bleeped fifteen times with fifteen different tones, and then stopped, going completely dead. 3PO had seen that before. No amount of resetting would bring it back. Its microprocessors would have to be cleansed. Any personality the astromech droid had was gone. R2 had stopped moving. His head swiveled. Brachis finally had R2's attention. Brachis smiled. He leveled the scrambler at 3PO. Give me any more trouble, and your golden friend will be wiped. 3PO held himself up as best he could. Begging would do no good now. 3PO was on his own. R2 bleeped softly, sadly. 3PO wrapped his arms around his head, and awaited a fate worse than death. Queller reached inside his robe and brought out the remote that Brachis had given him so long ago. With his thumb, he shut off all the protections. Every droid made by Brachis in the last two years would explode when Queller punched in his identification code. With both hands, Skywalker swung his lightsaber. Queller dodged, cursing his suddenly slow body. He needed just a moment to do the recognition. He held the remote up to his eye, hit the scan function, and a beam of light stabbed him as it identified his retina. Luke! Leia shouted. He's got a new weapon. But Skywalker said nothing. He was moving as slowly as Queller, coming forward, holding his lightsaber as if it were made of steel instead of light. The remote shut off the scan light and a tiny panel went up, revealing the number pad. A five-number sequence for all of them. Very simple, Brachis had said, to destroy them all. It was the small units that were hard. Queller had to specify the unit batch numbers. This one would be easy. He stepped out of the light as he punched in the first number. Leia was shouting. Skywalker was moving. Neither of them would reach him. He punched in the second and the third, wishing the dizziness would go away. Leia raised her hand. A white creature appeared behind Luke. Queller punched in the fourth number, and then the fifth. The remote beeped its acceptance, and relayed the commands all over the galaxy. 54. R2 bleeped again, this time with force. No. 3PO said, his eyes hidden. A loud, long, sustained crash made him bring his hands down. Astromech droids were breaking through the one-way glass. It coated Brachis. He was screaming and pulling glass shards from his hair. The scrambler was on the floor. Droids were converging on him, and without hesitating, he turned and ran through a side door. Droids followed, as his screams echoed through the hallway. R2 beeped in satisfaction, then went to the computer array and jacked in. 3PO went around the deactivated astromech droid, and watched R2's jack rotate. Whatever are you doing? R2 bleebled. How can you deactivate so many detonators from such a distance? 3PO said. Delusions of grandeur, that's what you have. 
Delusions. We have to get out of here before Brachis comes back. We have to find Master Cole. Our two blapped at him, shushing him. 3PO watched. Then our two squealed. What? What? Our two screamed, and 3PO waved his hands in distress. What do you mean they're being activated? Every new droid will explode. We'll die here a thousand times over. They'll never even find pieces of us. R2 whistled, then bleeped commands. What panel? How can I push a command button if I don't even know what panel? Still, 3PO hurried over to the computer panel, looking for the small button that R2 had described. R2 shrilled his response as 3PO found the button. R2 would send the deactivation code, but 3PO had to press the emergency frequency. It would, they hoped, intercept any other message. It would prevent explosions from happening. R2's jack stopped rotating. As he pulled the jack from the socket, he bleeped. Now. 3PO jammed his golden finger on the button once, twice, three times. Nothing happened. R2 was staring at a display screen. 3PO looked up. R2 started rocking back and forth. Then he shrilled a victory cry. We did it. 3PO said. R2 bleeped happily. We really did it. 3PO put his arm around his small friend. We're saved. Oh, R2, you're a genius. R2 burbled modestly. Well, I'm a genius too. After all, I did help you. I did listen to you, and you couldn't have done it alone. Why, if Master Cole and I hadn't come here, 3PO interrupted himself. Oh, dear. Master Cole. He's missing. We have to find him, R2, before something dreadful happens to him. R2 moaned softly. Oh, dear, 3PO said. I suppose that means it already has. Leia couldn't feel Luke anymore. It was as if his personality completely disappeared even though she could still see him, outlined against the tower in the growing twilight. Behind him, the Thurnby appeared, its huge face turning quizzically toward Queller. His presence was gone too. But she sensed someone else close, someone precious. She turned. Han was at the mouth of the alley, his blaster out, his face hidden in shadow. Chewbacca was behind him. She wanted to run to Han, but she couldn't. Not yet. Something was happening to Luke. At first she had thought he was going to die, as Obi-Wan did, but he didn't. Queller didn't hit him. Instead, Queller backed away and pulled out a small device. It was scanning his face. She had a bad feeling about this. Luke. She shouted, but Luke seemed to be ignoring her. He was trying to hold his lightsaber. He was missing his chance. Queller was going to do something awful and then get away. The light stopped scanning Queller's face. Leia raised her hand and called Han's blaster to her. It left his hands and zoomed toward her. The Thurnby saw her and its tail started to wag. It changed direction and came toward her. The blaster clipped in the air. She was losing her mental grip on it. She pulled it to her faster. It hit her hand as a blanket dropped across her mind. She stumbled backward, then pulled the blaster aloft. Queller was still holding the device up. She saw his fingers move against the light the device gave off. Even without feeling him through the force, she knew what he was going to do. He had told her when he arrived. It didn't matter that some of the droids had been turned off. So many hadn't. Those waves of cold. The concussion of the instant bomb. The laughter of her children. Leia raised the blaster, closed one eye, and lined the weapon up with Queller. He didn't see her. He couldn't even feel her. But Luke could. Leia. He shouted. Queller turned, and Leia didn't hesitate. The shot went directly for his head. He raised a hand to ward it off, but the hand did no good. The blaster shot knocked him backward. Leia. Luke shouted again. 
The Thurnby was coming toward her, a giant furry ghost in the darkness. Queller sat up, and Leia shot him one more time. He fell back, the device falling out of his hand. She crossed the tile, the heavy feeling growing stronger with each movement. Leia. Luke was beside her now. He took the blaster from her. She could feel his concern. Had she shot Queller out of hatred and anger? Probably. Would she be going to the dark side now? She didn't know. She couldn't feel the force at all anymore. Maybe it didn't count if she couldn't feel the force. She stopped over Queller's body. He looked smaller now, his arms raised above his head. Luke reached for her, but she moved out of his way, and bent over Queller. She slipped her fingers under his mask and ripped it away. He was a boy, his features only beginning to show the signs of where that Palpatine's had at the end. His dark eyes were open and lifeless, his mouth slack, but his features still had the roundness of youth, a sort of chubby charm that should have radiated joy instead of hatred. No wonder he had used the mask. A face like that would have terrified no one. He was just a child, she whispered. Luke crouched beside her. He took the mask from her hand. No, Leia. He lost his childhood before he came to Yavin 4. He knew what he was doing, what he had become. He set the mask on Queller's destroyed chest, stood, and helped Leia up. The Thurnby was right beside them, its tongue out. There's that blasted thing. Han said from behind them. I'd have been able to help if it hadn't eaten my E. Salamiri. So that's what that feeling is. Luke brought a hand to his face and laughed shakily. You helped, Han, old buddy. Let's just hope the Thurnby here starts to digest the E. Salamiri quickly. I wouldn't count on it, Han said. It swallowed the cages too. The Thurnby has eaten stranger things in the recent past, Luke said. Leia didn't care about the Thurnby. She took one last look at the man who had threatened her entire family. Then she turned around. Han was behind her, watching her. I love you, princess, he said softly. She launched herself into his arms and pulled him close. I know, she whispered. I know. 55. R2's handiwork had shut off all the droids in the facility, except for those without the detonator chip. Only the astromech units and 3PO apparently were without. The astromech units chased Brachis to his ship and watched as he took off to parts unknown. The computer held no clues as to Master Cole's whereabouts, so 3PO and R2 had to search the nearby compounds. They found him in a droid torture chamber that made the one in Jabba's palace look like a luxurious oil massage parlor. Master Cole was strapped to a bench and was partially unconscious. R2 determined that Master Cole was in no condition to fly the freighter. So 3PO sent messages to everyone he could think of, requesting a transport. He managed to raise Lando Calrissian, who chuckled and said that the Lady Luck was turning into a passenger liner. He promised to arrive shortly and pick them up. 3PO waited beside Master Cole. R2 had insisted on freeing the tortured droids, and he sent them to a repair area, hoping that they could help each other. R2 was puttering around the room, deactivating all its horrible equipment. He had already removed the torture devices on the evening of Denonetwo. Then Master Cole's hand moved. 3PO leaned over him, and was rewarded when Master Cole's eyelids fluttered. His eyes opened, he saw 3PO, and, he screamed. R2 beeped in response, hurrying toward 3PO's side. 3PO backed away from Master Cole. I'm so sorry, sir. It's just me. C-3PO, at your service. Master Cole's scream died, and he brought a hand to his face. R2 beeped at him sympathetically. We're still in this place. Only for a moment, sir, 3PO said. R2 has gotten us transport. Brockis? Master Cole said. He left, sir. The astromech droids attacked him, and he ran away. After I, R2 bleebled. Ah, after we defeated the Red Terror. The Red? Oh, it's a long story, sir, 
but quite intriguing. You see, after I left you, later, 3 p.o. Master Cole pulled himself up on his elbows and peered at R2. Did you solve what you needed to? R2 whistled his affirmative. Oh, more than solved it, sir. He deactivated all the detonators. It seems that Brachius designed them all to be handled from one remote, although why he would do that seems quite unusual to me. R2 assures me that it is custom among droid manufacturers. It allows for defective models to be deactivated, even in difficult-to-reach areas where, can no one shut him up? Master Cole said as he rolled off the table. He moaned slightly. I don't think you should be getting up, sir. I don't think I want to stay here any longer. Where is the freighter? Where we left it, sir. But you are in no condition to fly it. Master Calrissian shall be here shortly. He'll take us back to Coruscant. 3PO moved to help Master Cole stand, but Master Cole flinched. Did they hurt you badly, sir? Master Cole gave him a withering glance. It didn't exactly tickle. 3PO nodded. Well, sir, it might do you good to remember two things. R2 and I did rescue you, and if you'll forgive my impertinence, sir, no two droids are alike. I know many sentients forget that, but we are individuals and can remain so without a memory wipe. Master Cole smiled. I know that, 3PO. You startled me when I came to. And as for the rest, well, it hurts to be touched at the moment. I'm sure that will fade. He gazed down at R2, who hovered near him. I've learned from both of you never to underestimate a droid. I've been as bad as the rest of the galaxy in taking you all for granted. I'll never do that again. R2 beeped happily. What did he say? Master Cole asked. That it sounds as if you'll be all right now. 3PO's hand clanged as it rested on R2's head. It seems, thanks to R2's quick thinking and my negotiation skills, that we'll all be fine now. Master Cole grinned. I think you're right, 3PO. I think you're right. Mon Mothma walked Leia to the redesigned Imperial Ballroom. Leia was wearing a copy of her white dress, but she had foregone the braids wrapped around her ears. Instead, she wore her hair down. Han had smiled at her before she left the suite, and had made her promise to return from the Senate early. The children were due back the following day. He wanted to make the most of his time alone with her. So did she. I still don't understand how you got them to call off the recall election, Leia said. Mon Mothma smiled. I didn't, Leia. You did. You and Wedge and Han and Luke. If you hadn't successfully defeated Queller, you would have come back here to a political storm unlike any you've ever seen. But when it became clear that Han wasn't involved in the bombing, and instead you all had been the ones who caught the culprit, Mido and his followers could do nothing else but support you. Leia clasped her hands behind her back. But you had to have done something. You already had Mido off the inner council by the time I came back. Mon Mothma shrugged. I've had more years of experience dealing with divergent voices than you have, Leia. You'll need to learn how to work with a group that is no longer homogeneous. The Senate won't always agree on policy anymore. You'll have to build coalitions. With Imperials? Leia asked, shuddering. Former Imperials who really had nothing to do with the Empire. You can't always blame people for their pasts. You should know that better than anyone, President Organa Solo. Mon Mothma had a point. Han's past was shady at best, and yet he was getting a hero's commendation for his work with the wounded on Smuggler's Run. So was Lando. Lando had already asked Leia how much financial compensation went along with the commendation, and had frowned when she said that gratitude came without monetary reward. And then she had promised to pay, out of her own pocket if she had to, for the refurbishing of the Lady Luck. It was the least she could do. Lando had saved hundreds of lives. Any word from Chewbacca? Mon Mothma asked. Leia nodded. He and the Alderaan are due at any point. It took him a while to find the wild pride of Thurnbees. Apparently, when their number had been so badly hunted by the Jahar, 
they had moved away from their normal stomping grounds. But Chewie was able to deliver our Thurnby back to them. He sounds like a delightful creature. He was too big and pesky to be delightful, Leia said. And it took him two days to digest the e-salamiri. Mara, Luke, and I were stuck in the Falcon, playing holographic games while Han and Chewie argued about who would repair the damage. They must have fixed it. Leia grinned. They did. After Mara threatened to shoot them both. Mon Mothma laughed. They stopped in front of the ballroom door. Mon Mothma put her hand on Leia's arm. You realize that some of the senators are saying 3PO and R2 should be deactivated for taking such initiative. They also want action taken against Cole Fardreamer. The theft of the freighter has them all disturbed. They'll try to make that the first order of business. Leia glanced at the closed doors. The last time she had gone into a senate chamber dressed like this, she had been worried about the petty backbiting of the senators. The explosion had come out of the blue, had ruined so many lives, and had made those worries seem trivial. Queller. His youthful face would haunt her longer than his death mask would. His actions would haunt her longer still. He had taken so many lives without a single thought. And it had taken so much to defeat him. She would do everything she could in her position as chief of state to see that no other monsters like him were created under her watch. And the first order of business would be to make sure no truth got distorted by opportunistic politicians. They won't succeed in deactivating the droids, she said. R2 and 3PO are heroes. I have some ideas about changing the laws regarding droids. And they won't touch Cole Fardreamer. He discovered the flaws in the new X-Wings. It's on his suggestion that we're returning to the older models. I'll take care of all of this. I also have some bridge building to do. Sounds like a busy day, Mon Mothma said. It can't be too busy, Leia said. Luke is having his last back to treatment this afternoon, and I plan to be there when he wakes up. Then I am going home. Han promised dinner for me. And no children until tomorrow, Mon Mothma said. Leia smiled. A person always has to make the best of every situation, she said. Oh, you do, Leia, Mon Mothma said. The moment had suddenly gotten too serious for Leia. She put her arm around Mon Mothma's waist. A whole new chapter in here. Leia said. Yes, Mon Mothma said. And the first order of business is for me to step down and you to regain your post. Think they'll ratify my return? Leia asked. Without dissent, Mon Mothma said. Then they opened the door to the temporary Senate Hall. Leia was already planning her speech. It would be different from the one she had planned so long ago. This one would be about unity and respect. She would set the tone for the new Senate term. And this time, she would do it right. End of the New Rebellion about the author. Christine Catherine Rush is an award-winning mystery, romance, science fiction, and fantasy writer. She has written many novels under various names, including Christine Grayson for Romance, and Chris Nelscott for Mystery. Her novels have made the bestseller lists, and have been published in 14 countries and 13 different languages. Her awards range from the Ellery Queen Reader's Choice Award to the John W. Campbell Award. She is the only person in the history of the science fiction field to have won a Hugo Award for editing and a Hugo Award for fiction. Her short work has been reprinted in 16 years' best collections. She is the former editor of the prestigious The Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. Before that, she and Dean Wesley Smith started and ran Pulp House Publishing, a science fiction and mystery press in Eugene. She lives and works on the Oregon coast.